This is the Humanist Report with Mike Figueredo. The Humanist Report podcast is funded by viewers like you through Patreon and PayPal. To support the show, visit patreon.com forward slash humanist report or become a member at humanistreport.com. Now, enjoy the show. Welcome to the Humanist Report Podcast. My name is Mike Figueredo, and this is episode 243 of the program. Today is Friday, May 29th, the last episode of the month. And before we get started, I want to take some time to thank all of our newest Patreon, PayPal, and YouTube members, all of which either sign up for the very first time to support us this week or increase their monthly pledge. And that includes Chris Courtney, Coralie LaSalle, Dave Natal, Echo, Ghost, Gracie Pacos, I Am a Bolt Nut, Jorge M, Leo Edwards, Lizbeth Raphael, and Paul Curtis. So thank you so much to all of these kind individuals. If you'd also like to support the show and join the independent progressive media revolution, you could do so by going to humanistreport.com slash support, patreon.com slash humanistreport, or by clicking join underneath any one of our YouTube videos. So this week, we have another deeply depressing and demoralizing episode of the podcast. I don't know what to tell you. Um, I can't control the news cycle. So we will talk about how we are nearing 100,000 deaths due to COVID-19 in the United States. And as we approach this horrific milestone, Trump is patting himself on the back about the great job that he's doing. Also, Bernie Sanders puts out a bad tweet, and I scold him for that. Joy Reid faces backlash for very tepidly criticizing Joe Biden. Republicans are gearing up to gut Social Security once again, and they're also suing the state of California to stop mail-in voting from taking place during a pandemic. Andrew Yang makes important endorsements in key congressional races in order to oust corporate Democrats. Michaela Wilkes is gaining steam in her race against Sandy Hoyer. And another black man was murdered by cops in America. We'll talk about George Floyd. And finally, we closed the week by talking to 2020 candidate for the United States Senate, Paula Jean Swearingen, about her race and how she is now poised to defeat Shelley Moore Capito. So that's what we've got on the agenda for today's show. Hopefully you all will uh, enjoy it. Let's get right to through it. This is going to be a doozy. So uh, buckle up. It's not going to be a fun one. So we are about to pass 100,000 American deaths due to COVID-19. 100,000. I mean, when a family loses a loved one, it's awful. I know from firsthand experience, months of mourning and, you know, just reeling from the loss, trying to process it, trying to move on. But that's happening to 100,000 families currently, if not more. And, you know, it's a number that is so large, I mean, you can't help but think what a difficult and dark time we are in. This is one of the darkest times in American history. This is so tragic. There aren't words to really describe how awful this is. There, there's just no words for it. But at a time when we're all reeling from, you know, this virus that is ravaging the country, Donald Trump thought it would be a good idea to uh, put out this tweet where he pats himself on the back about the good job that he's doing with regard to his handling of COVID-19. He writes, Great reviews on our handling of COVID-19, sometimes referred to as the China virus. Very necessary to add that. Ventilators, testing, medical supply distribution. We made a lot of governors look very good and got no credit for so doing. Most importantly, we helped a lot of great people. Yeah, so I mean, this is completely delusional. Read the room. Nobody cares about you, Donald Trump. This isn't about you. We don't care about the good job you're doing. Nobody's thinking about how wonderful of a job you've been doing. Everybody is thinking about the virus. Nobody cares about you. He's incapable of not making something about him. Whatever the issue is, he's got to make it about him. Is the same thing with Hurricane Maria. He had to make it about himself and how great of a job people are supposedly saying he's doing. Nobody cares about you. Nobody cares about you. We're not thinking about you. The world doesn't revolve around you, you know, unfortunately, as that may be to you. It doesn't. So, I mean, the fact that he's not reading the room, it's a very Trumpian thing to do, but this is delusional. He's saying that he's handling this in a good way, and he specifically points out testing. You think that you've done a good job supplying states with tests? Really? 
You know, for all this talk about reopening the country and the need to do it as quickly as possible, we could actually maybe do that if there were enough tests. But there's not enough tests. We are not testing nearly as much people as we need to be, which is why, you know, a resurgence of this virus is almost guaranteed at this point, right? Because if you reopen the country when it's still, you know, destroying the country, wreaking havoc on Americans, then how do you expect it to ever go away if you're not testing enough people, if you're not doing contact tracing? So he's delusional. But, you know, to speak to the good job that he's supposedly doing, there was a report that came out just last week that goes over data that shows that if the U.S., hypothetically, decided to impose social distancing requirements just one week earlier, that could have saved 36,000 lives. If he acted just a little bit sooner, thousands of lives could have been spared. And on top of that, he's making matters worse by declaring churches essential and calling for them to reopen. You know, he's basically adding to this chorus of people, these pundits who want the country to be re reopened as soon as possible, when, I mean, we're reaching 100,000 deaths. Do you honestly think now is the right time? Now I get like when ordinary Americans want to go back to work, I understand that because they're suffering. So, you know, it's not like Donald Trump just failed when it comes to not acting. He continues to fail because he's not acting when it comes to an economic response. Why haven't we seen a temporary UBI? Why haven't we seen, you know, rent cancellation? He is a failure in every single sense of the word. Sure, you can give him credit for postponing student loan repayments. And, you know, he's going to boast about that $1,200 stimulus. But that's not enough. That's not enough. And it's funny, I just got my stimulus um, over the weekend, and to see his name on the check is surreal. He wants all of the credit, but he doesn't want to take responsibility for the areas where he failed. You failed to respond, and uh, you're still not meeting the needs of people. Rather than giving people economic relief and doing your job, you just want to send them back to work. And you don't even care what the consequences of that action will be. Sure, they may go back to work if we reopen a little bit too early and end up getting COVID-19 and dying, but that doesn't matter to Donald Trump. And sure, the economy is important, but you're not going to save the economy if you send people back to work too early and they end up dying and getting sick because that too is bad for the economy. So not only has he mishandled this virus in a way that is undeniable, but he's still not taking the proper action. We still don't have enough tests. We don't have economic relief and he can't read the room because now he's wanting everyone to pat him on the back. No, we're not going to pat you on the back. And, you know, to show you how out of touch he is, his slogan for 2020, keep America great at a time when more than 100,000 Americans will have died by the time that the November election takes place. His campaign slogan is keep America great. Yes, because with another depression widespread anxiety over what's going to happen if people are going to lose their livelihoods and material wealth with worry about their loved ones getting COVID-19. Keep America Great is the exact type of slogan you would expect from an out-of-touch elite like Donald Trump, who doesn't care about the virus, who doesn't actually care about the death toll and saving lives, he doesn't care what happens, like a million people could die. And the only thing that he would care about is that you think he did a good job throughout this process, that without him, we'd be worse off. He doesn't care about suffering. He just wants you to think that he did a good job because he is a narcissist. But saying that is, uh, it, it doesn't even mean anything because it's so obvious, right? So, I mean, this guy is a fucking absolute tool. And for him to tweet this right now and pat himself on the back as we reach this horrible milestone... I mean, it's not like it's shocking. It just is irritating, you know? Maybe just shut the fuck up for a little bit. So usually Bernie Sanders' Twitter game is on point, but he recently put out a tweet that is uh, really wrong. It's bad 
on multiple levels, and I should be more specific here. One of Bernie Sanders' staffers put out a tweet on his behalf, and it reads like something an overpaid Democratic Party consultant would write, and there's like a 0% chance that Bernie Sanders himself wrote this. But it's still bad, and you know it's really antithetical to what Bernie Sanders has been fighting for, because what does the left want? What was the point of Bernie's presidency? Of course, to get policies that we want enacted, we being the left collectively, but the broader goal was to take over the Democratic Party. We wanted a hostile takeover so that way, you know, the corporate wing is no longer in control. They're no longer steering the party off of a cliff and following Republicans to the right. But before I babble on any further, let's get to the tweet itself. It says, Republicans make fun of Democrats who have political differences. Really? That's democracy. What is sad and dangerous is to see a Republican party, including many who know better, surrender to the will and vindictiveness of their stable genius leader. That's authoritarianism. All right, so first and foremost, that first sentence is incorrect. I mean, I rarely see Republicans making fun of Democrats for having political differences. I don't think that Republicans see any difference between Democrats. They don't realize that there is, you know, factionalization and intra-party warfare, quite frankly, within the Democratic Party. They don't realize the differences between the left or the center-right. And if they do, it's to be disingenuous. It's to claim that, you know, the left, individuals like Ilhan Omar, AOC, who make up a very small minority within the party, unfortunately, are the ones who are pulling all the strings. That's just not true. And just last week, in an interview with Fox Business, Dan Crenshaw, with a straight face, claimed that Nancy Pelosi is a socialist who wants to institute socialism in America. Does that sound like Nancy Pelosi? If you are on the left, in any way, does Nancy Pelosi represent you from the standpoint of her wanting to <laughs> move us anywhere near, not even like social democracy, but socialism? Of course not. So they don't have any sort of nuance when they discuss the differences between the left and the center-right within the Democratic Party. So that in and of itself doesn't make sense. You're just making that up. Uh, second of all, Assuming that Republicans actually did make fun of the differences, because maybe this tweet is referencing some interview, I don't know, but assuming that they were going to have a conversation about the differences between the left and the corporate wing of the Democratic Party, to just say that that's political differences is a gross oversimplification because this isn't about political differences. One side is driven by ideology, the other side is driven by corporate money. The left wants policies that help the working class, whereas the center and the center right in the Democratic Party, they don't want anything but neoliberalism instituted. And I don't even necessarily know that they came into Congress with this neoliberal line of thinking, but the reason why they're only willing to propose neoliberal solutions to any problems is because they are capitalists to their core. As Nancy Pelosi said, we're just capitalists. That's the way it is. And the reason why they're capitalists is because they don't want to do anything that would offend their corporate donors. Because the way that you get elected, the way that you keep your job in Congress is to make sure you can raise enough money each election cycle to put out more ads and drown out your opponent. And if you do too much and you offend your donors, then they give you less money. So if you start talking about Medicare for all... Well, your health industry donors are not going to like that and they're not going to donate to you. Therefore, that will diminish your chances of getting elected. Now, that's just one of many issues, but this isn't a real disagreement. Like, one side is bought and paid for, the other side is not. The other side actually wants real policies implemented that will affect working class people in a positive way. So this isn't some type of ideological disagreement. To call it that is incredibly disingenuous, and Bernie Sanders himself knows better, which is why the staffer who made this tweet should never be allowed to tweet on his behalf anymore. But it goes deeper than that. So the tweet also adds, what is sad and dangerous is to see a Republican party, including many who know better, surrender to the will and vindictiveness of their stable genius leader. That's authoritarianism. So first of all, it is incredibly naive to assume that there are any Republicans that know better. If you are a Republican, then you do not know better because the Republican Party's ideology is not just morally bankrupt, but it has been discredited on numerous occasions. But yet we still see their worldview, a minority party's worldview, 
pushed down our throats. We're still doing trickle-down economics. They just passed tax cuts for the rich in 2017. The Republican Party is not comprised of individuals who know better on any issue. They are wrong on every single issue. And every once in a while, they'll say, say something that isn't completely insane. But I mean, a broken clock is right twice a day. We shouldn't give them credit when almost everything that they want is to the detriment of our society. They are the party of death and destruction. They want wars. They want late-stage capitalism to the extreme. So, I mean, to say that they know better, that gives them credit that they don't deserve. But furthermore, for Republicans to surrender to the will of Donald Trump, that's not authoritarianism. That is an ideological takeover. That's what we wanted to do on the left. We wanted Bernie Sanders to become president so that way we could take control of the party. Pry the corporate wing's hands off of the steering wheel and start driving the bus in a better direction. How is that authoritarianism? How is that authoritarianism? You can argue that the way that Donald Trump was elected wasn't very democratic, right? He got less votes than his opponent, and yet he still is president. You can argue based on that, but that's not really the argument here. The argument here is that everyone within the Demo or the Republican Party, rather, they basically surrendered to Donald Trump. Well, that's what happens if you win. That's exactly what we wanted to do on the left. That doesn't necessarily mean that Donald Trump is authoritarian. Putting aside his authoritarian instincts, he does have them, but that doesn't make him an authoritarian. He has created a brand of politics that the Republican Party likes. And anyone, any other Republican Party politician who doesn't go along with Trumpism, like Jeff Flake, for example, they get marginalized. They become outcasts. And that's exactly what we wanted to do on the left. Anyone who was against Medicare for all, we wanted to shame. We wanted to marginalize, right? So this tweet, it's it just from top to bottom, it's a bad tweet. As I stated, it reads like an overpaid Democratic Party consultant wrote it. And Bernie Sanders is an independent. He is not a Democrat. So it's really irritating to see him be all rah-rah Democratic Party, you know, and he's going to probably be this way until the election is over because as many people, you know, in the left have agreed, he probably just feels like he's responsible for Donald Trump winning in 2016 and he shouldn't be. He shouldn't feel responsible. That loss is on the Democratic Party, on Hillary Clinton specifically, but I mean, Bernie Sanders, what, what does this, you know, accomplish? Why would a staffer tweet this out? It shows you that Bernie Sanders surrounds himself with a lot of people who don't have interests that align with him. You know, Bernie's job is not to do Democratic Party apologia. Bernie Sanders' job is to push left-wing policies, you know, uh, on the Democratic Party, force them to adopt it, shame them until they adopt it, whatever strategy you want to do, but don't, like, lie to people about what this party is about. You can say, rightfully so, that the Democratic Party is, you know, nominally better than the Republican Party. Sure, nobody would take issue with that on the left, but you can't pretend as if they're a good party because the Democratic Party is a rotten institution that has to be taken over. It may be irredeemable, right? We may not be able to reconcile the differences between the left and the center, which is why we're having this battle, which is why, you know, we are waging war on the corporate wing of the party because we want to do what, you know, Donald Trump was able to accomplish, get them to surrender. So I just, the tweet doesn't make sense. I don't get why this was uh, greenlit by someone on Bernie's team, but Bernie, cut off their access to Twitter. Don't let staffers tweet on your behalf. We follow you because we want to hear your thoughts, not what some, you know, idiot who is one of your staffers has to say. Uh, this is just, it's, it's wrong in so many ways that I can't believe that this was approved to be tweeted out. It's a bad tweet. Joe Biden's interview with Charlemagne the God on The Breakfast Club was an unmitigated disaster, to say the least. Um, you know, his statements went viral immediately. Donald Trump's team capitalized on that gaffe, if we want to call it a gaffe, by selling hashtag you ain't black t-shirts and also releasing an ad about Joe Biden's record when it comes to mass incarceration. It was just awful. It was a train wreck. But I want to go back to Charlemagne the God's broader point about Joe Biden needing to appeal to a very loyal demographic that is always there for the Democratic Party. African-American voters, especially 
black women. They are always there. They are the most loyal group that always delivers victories to Democrats. So the point that Charlemagne was making overall was restated in an interview with Joy Reid on MSNBC, and they had a really honest and open conversation, which is something you don't usually see in mainstream media. But nonetheless, they talked about the need of Joe Biden to appeal to black voters. And afterwards, uh, Joy Reid actually took a lot of heat for this interview. Take a look. What 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 are people telling you that they want him to do? Uh, just some really major policy commitments for the black community, uh, mainly in the form of economic justice. So we can you know tip the scales on some of this wealth inequality in America. Um, I do hear a lot of people say, you know, we also want him to have a black woman running mate, you know, but not just any black woman running mate, one that's going to actually, you know, get in office and care that black people benefit from her presence there. You know, we need substance and significance over symbolism. And he's already committed to putting a black woman on the Supreme Court. So I just want him and the Democratic Party to know that it's time to give back to the black community in a very tangible way. But I, I can say that, you know, the major the major point that I'm hearing about is just, you know, economic justice, some form of economic justice. And um, let me play the apology that um, Joe Biden gave. He, he got on a call with black business leaders and apologized for the comment that he made at the end of your show. Uh, let me let you listen to that. The last thing I want to do, and I shouldn't have been such a wise guy. I shouldn't have been so cavalier in responding to what I thought was. A, anyway, it, it was I don't take it for granted at all. And no one, no one should have to vote for any party based on their race, their religion, their background. Do you do you think there's a risk that not just Joe Biden, but the Democratic Party in general just takes for granted that, well, the black, the, you know, the black people are with us, so we don't really have to give them anything else. They're going to vote for us regardless. Look, they voted for Joe Biden in overwhelming numbers, six in 10 black voters, particularly in southern states. They all voted for Joe Biden. We don't need to offer anything more. Do you worry that that is the attitude that Democrats are taking toward the black community? <laughs> I mean, I, I know that's the attitude, you know? I mean, that's why I don't even care about the, the words and the lip service and the apology is cool, but the best apology is actually a black agenda. You know, they got to make some real policy commitments to black people. We got to stop back and like, the fact that blacks are overrepresented in America when it comes to welfare, poverty, unemployment, homelessness, drug addiction, crime, coronavirus, like that's no accident. Like the whole function of systemic racism is to marginalize black people. And as the great Dr. Claude Anderson says in the book Powernomics, white society has an out of sight, out of mind attitude about racism. And they don't like to have any discussions of substance about systemic racism. So when you have black people who have the nerve, the audacity, the unmitigated gall to act like citizens and demand something of our vote, it's a problem. Like you, it's, just, it's like you got, you know, whites telling telling us to stay in our place and you got black people saying, oh, stop. Now is not the time. You're going to get Trump reelected. It has to come to a point where we stop putting the burden on black voters to show up for Democrats and start putting the burden on Democrats to show up for black voters. Now, I think that was actually a really honest conversation that I want to see more of. Right. There's this sense that if you say anything negatively about a Democrat or the Democratic Party's nominee ever, then you're just automatically, you know, helping Donald Trump. But that's not true. We're all adults. We can be honest and open about what we're getting. Joe Biden is not a good candidate. He's just not. So I think these types of conversations are important to educate voters and also show viewers of MSNBC that they are capable of criticizing Democrats because this is just the propaganda arm of the Democratic Party usually. So it is nice and refreshing, honestly, to see them have these types of frank conversations. Now, I will just say, though, because this kind of is bothering me, Charlemagne the God is saying all of this about Joe Biden, but didn't he support Pete Buttigieg during the primary? Like, I don't know if he openly endorsed Pete Buttigieg, but he was featured in a Pete Buttigieg ad and stumped for him, at least digitally. So, I mean, it, it, it doesn't make sense why you're being so hard on Joe Biden when you supported a candidate who was almost as weak as Joe Biden in the primary. And he also uh, supported Kamala Harris. And if he didn't endorse her, he made the case for her on CNN or MSNBC. So, I mean, he's not very consistent, but at times he does make good points. And I do think that this is one of those times. And he says, uh, pretty simply what he wants is strong policy concessions, tangibles to black America. And I think this is just common sense. I mean, the democratic party has got to acknowledge that you can only expect the support of a community 
for so long until once they realize that you're not serious about delivering them the goods, whatever that may be, they're going to abandon you. You're just not going to automatically have their support. And that's a problem that Democrats are having with a lot of different demographics. I mean, Democrats are on the cusp of losing two generations, millennials and Gen Z. They, uh, Joe Biden in particular, is having difficulties appealing to Latino voters. So the problem is that Democrats do take these communities for granted. They think that they have these demographics on lock because these demographics, statistically speaking, aren't likely to want to support someone like Donald Trump. But just not liking Donald Trump is an evidence that they're going to vote for you. The problem is that voter apathy is a real issue for Democrats. And the issue is that they stay home. And when that happens, Democrats lose. So I don't think it's too much to ask for Joe Biden to make major economic concessions. In fact, everyone should be asking for major policy concessions for Joe Biden because the country is hurting right now. Everyone's hurting right now. So why is it so unreasonable for Charlemagne the God to say, maybe since black people are so loyal to the Democratic Party, you deliver us something. Deliver us economic justice. Give us something. Reward us for constantly being there for you when, you know, voter turnout is one of the biggest issues. When our community has to put up with, you know, these obstacles to voting, you know, since the Voting Rights Act was gutted, voter ID laws and whatnot. Like, that, that is common sense. That's what you do to win elections. You make sure that you enact policies that benefit the people that are loyal to you. Otherwise, they're not going to be loyal to you. You shouldn't assume that they're always going to be there for you. Now, Joy Reid made a similar point. She said, do you think there's a risk that not just Joe Biden, but the Democratic Party in general just takes for granted black people are with us, so we don't really have to give them anything else because they're going to vote for us regardless? Yeah, I think there is a risk of that, and I think that they're already taking black voters for granted. I do. And for this comment, Joy Reid got a lot of hatred online. Like, not everyone disagreed with her, but her usual following was very against this, to put it lightly. And we'll get to some of the feedback here. But Charlemagne adds, there has to be a time when we stop putting the burden on black voters to show up for Democrats and start putting the burden on Democrats to show up for black voters. And he's correct here. And this is true not just of black voters, but all the voters. It's time for Democrats to actually deliver policy concessions to their base. But they don't do that. They take not just black voters for granted, but all voters for granted. And that's, that's bad. That's bad politics. If you see one thing that is consistent with Donald Trump is that he is constantly throwing red meat to his base. It doesn't matter how you know bad the optics may be. He's constantly trying to make it seem as if he is representing their interests. He hasn't stopped talking about you know the wall and being xenophobic. That's what they want. But Democrats, they try you know to have it both ways and appeal to more conservative leaning Republican Party voters while thinking that, you know, the left is going to be there for them and black voters and Latino voters are going to be there for them when that's not the way that this works. The further to the right that the Democratic Party moves, the more of the left they leave out. And those people aren't just going to, you know, be drug along by the Democratic Party because there's no other option. They're just not going to vote. They check out of electoral politics. That's what happens. That's what we've seen happen before. It happened in 2016. So I think this conversation is incredibly important. Uh, but a lot of people, namely MSNBC's audience, you know, they haven't been conditioned to accept any criticism of Democrats. They hate it, right? Because MSNBC is largely the propaganda wing of the Democratic Party. So when you look at this video's uh, dislikes on YouTube, for an MSNBC video, that's relatively high. That's a lot of dislikes. And one of the top commenters said this, at this point, I feel like even the Democrats want to give Trump four more years. So that's why these types of open and honest conversations don't usually take place, because they have created monsters that won't allow them to attack Democrats. So whenever they actually do attack Democrats, they see backlash. It's why, you know, Fire Chris Hayes started trending once he covered Tara Reid's allegations against Joe Biden. Like, you, you reap what you sow. If you have an audience that you have taught to never criticize Democrats, any and all criticism is illegitimate, you know, by definition, because Republicans are bad, this is what's going to happen. You restrict yourself. You kind of back yourself into an ideological and intellectual corner to where you can't criticize Democrats. You can't run segments like this where you are actually doing a good job.
Now, on Twitter, that's where Joy Reid got most of the backlash, and she posted a clip of this segment, and some of her fans were not too happy about it. One person tweeted, When Trump gets reelected and continues to appoint conservative judges who will give harsh sentences to black men, I want you to look back at this much-to-do-about-nothing exposure you're participating in. You're not covering the context of Joe Biden in artful remarks. Another person says, I think we have reached that stage. Democrats try to level the field for all Americans, but it's an uphill battle against the Republican propaganda machine. Democrats cannot favor, quote, only blacks. The right thing is to work for all Americans. The damn platform is America's best hope. So obviously, the entire point that Joy Reid and Charlemagne was trying to make went over this person's head, but nonetheless, there's more. Just scrolling now, and Joshua Johnson on MSNBC, same thing, beating Joe up over and over. Nothing about the depravity of Donald J. Trump. Seriously? question. Does MSM really want Trump another four years? Is this a ratings thing? Another person says, so another four years of Trump is an acceptable outcome if Biden fails to court black voters in a manner that meets their approval? So, I mean, these comments are completely delusional. Completely delusional. You really don't think that MSNBC covers Donald Trump enough and beats up on Donald Trump enough? They don't just cover Donald Trump now that he's president. Like, during the 2015 and 2016 Republican Party primary, they covered him arguably more so than the Democratic part primary. They gave Donald Trump more coverage than Bernie Sanders. So what are you talking about? But you see, this is the type of audience that MSNBC has created. They made it unacceptable. They set the standard that any and all criticism of Democrats is bad. The only person who you can criticize is Bernie Sanders, but any other Democrat is bad. And, you know, if you criticize them at all, it's blasphemy. Talk about Republicans and how bad they are constantly. Never points out maybe Republicans are winning because Democrats are so horrible. This is what MSNBC has done. They have lowered discourse as a network by, you know, engaging in sensationalist clickbait journalism where they just, you know, uh, talk about Donald Trump nonstop, which is important. He's the president, right? But they never point out the flaws with the Democratic Party. The flaws that if Democrats corrected maybe would stop people like Donald Trump from taking office. And here's the thing. At some point, Donald Trump will not be president. That day will come. He's not going to be president forever, right? He's only a human being, uh, even if there's some sort of authoritarian power grab and he just chooses to stay in power forever. He's only a human being. He's not going to live forever. So there will be a day where we are in the post-Trump era in American politics. Maybe, you know, Republican Party politicians emulate his strategy. Who knows? But Trump will not be in power forever. And there's always going to be a Republican who is bad, right? It was the same with George W. Bush, who Democrats seem to love all of a sudden. But there's always going to be a Republican boogeyman. But if you ever want to beat said Republican boogeyman or boogeywoman, if Ivanka wants to run or whatever, you have to fix the issues with your own house. You have to make sure that Democrats are doing enough to appeal to their base. And quite frankly, they're not. So maybe if more of these types of honest conversations took place on MSNBC, maybe Democrats would listen because they watch MSNBC. MSNBC is an establishment-based media outlet. Maybe if they didn't, you know, cater to the needs of the Democratic Party establishment, maybe they might actually listen. Maybe if more of these conversations took place you know, things would be different. But MSNBC is the one who did this. They built up this audience of conspiracy mongering, you know, uh, blue MAGA Kool-Aid drinking monsters who won't let them criticize anyone but Republicans and Donald Trump specifically. Now, look, I don't want to give you the impression that all of the comments towards Joy Reid were negative because she actually did get a lot of praise for being honest and open about Joe Biden. But I mean, just the mere fact that MSNBC pundits continuously get backlash for talking about Democrats in an objective way, it shows you that, you know, the Democratic Party and their loyalists they are becoming just as culty as the MAGA cult. I mean, how many more articles will be released from pundits who say, you know, I, I don't care, you know, Joe Biden, you know, he could boil and eat babies and I'd still vote for him. I mean, this is becoming a cult. And these are the same people who accused Bernie Sanders supporters of being a cult. When we can criticize Bernie Sanders, we're capable of introspection. But Here's the thing. If you truly do want to beat Republicans, then you can't just mute your criticisms of the Democratic Party because they're not perfect. That may be something that is difficult for you to hear if you're a Democratic Party loyalist, 
but they're not perfect. In fact, they're very flawed. And if you actually listen to some of the criticisms, primarily from people on the left, maybe you guys might not have to worry so much about Republicans. Maybe if Democrats course corrected, it would be Republicans following Democrats to the left and away from extremism on the right. You know, I'm old enough to remember a time when Republicans at least pretended to actually be in favor of states' rights, but now they don't even try to maintain the facade. You know, it's full mask off. They're hypocrites. They're, you know, electoral opportunists. And if there's a states' rights issue at stake that doesn't help them, then they don't care. They'll show their colors, their true colors immediately. Um, but this is what we've come to expect from the Republican Party. So when it comes to states' rights and voting, you know, I don't know if you all know about this, but we're currently in a pandemic and we have a major election coming up in November. So assuming that the pandemic persists until that time, voters have to be given some alternative. They can't be forced to risk their lives to come out and vote in a pandemic. So of course, I think that mail-in voting is a no-brainer. We do it in Oregon. It's been this way for decades. Everyone here loves it, Republicans and Democrats. But California Governor Gavin Newsom has chosen to institute vote by mail, and the Republican Party is suing him. You heard that right. They are suing him for choosing to do vote by mail during a pandemic. I mean, never mind that this should be the norm, even if we're not living through a pandemic, but the fact that they're suing him for instituting vote by mail during a pandemic adds to the absurdity of this story. So as William Cummings of USA Today reports, the Republican Party launched a legal battle to block California Governor Gavin Newsom from sending all voters in his state mail-in ballots for the general election, arguing the move is unconstitutional and invites voter fraud. The Republican National Committee, National Republican Congressional Committee, and California Republican Party filed a lawsuit Sunday against Newsom and Secretary of State Alex Padilla in the U.S. District Court for the Eastern District of California. In their complaint, the groups called the Democratic governor's action an illegal usurpation of the legislature's authority to set the time, place, and manner of the election, which they said constitutionally rests with the state legislature. This brazen power grab was not authorized by state law and violates both the election clause and electors clause of the U.S. Constitution, the complaint says. On May 8th, Newsom signed an executive order stating that every registered California voter would be sent a mail-in ballot because of concerns about the spread of coronavirus. Elections and the right to vote are foundational to our democracy, Newsom said in a statement. No Californian should be forced to risk their health in order to exercise their right to vote. So, I mean, there's so much to say about this, but let's just pause for a moment and think about the Republican Party and what they view is, you know, an abuse of power or a power grab, whatever language they used. They're perfectly fine with voter ID laws. They're perfectly fine with restricting the number of polling places in precincts. They're perfectly fine with legally questionable voter purges in states like Georgia and elsewhere. But when it comes to a governor signing an executive order that allows citizens to vote by mail during a pandemic, that's where they draw the line. That's an unconstitutional power grab. And understand, they don't have much of a leg to stand on here because they constantly cry voter fraud. Trump does the same thing. But they can never prove it. They never present you with evidence. And that's because there is no evidence that vote by mail invites mass voter fraud, which is why they use language like it invites voter fraud because they can't actually prove that it is conducive to voter fraud. If you go to the Heritage Foundation's uh, election fraud website, you can look at each state and they basically will uh, catalog all of the instances of voter fraud. Go to Oregon and there's less than 13 over the last 20 years. So clearly they can't prove that this will lead to voter fraud, which is why they have to fear monger and say, oh, you know, it'll invite voter fraud. We're not saying definitely, but it just opens the door to voter fraud more so than machines? How? They don't have an argument. And understand that they're basically trying to get him on a technicality. This is a very, you know, Democrat tactic. They're trying to say, well, you didn't fill out the proper paperwork. You know, you did this via executive action, whereas if you did this via the legislature and got it passed that way, then we'd be okay with it. We're not against vote by mail because that would encourage more people to vote, which means we'd probably lose. We're against it because you didn't do it properly. You signed an executive order and we're against that. We're against 
power grabs. I mean, they're clowns. They're absolute clowns. Let's be very real about the intentions of the RNC and the Republican Party. Here's the thing. If more people turn out to vote, that hurts them every single time because the Republican Party is a minority party. Most people, the overwhelming majority of Americans, do not identify with the Republican Party. So they know the only way that they can get power and maintain power is by disenfranchising thousands and thousands of voters. And, of course, a form of voter suppression is forcing people to vote during a pandemic. And if more people have an option to vote, then um, that means that they they may not be as successful. They don't care that, you know, they're win winning illegitimately. They just care that they win. And make no mistake about it, this isn't just about California, because I think that they realize California is a deep blue state, and to them it's a lost cause, but they don't want the popularity of mail-in voting to catch on, because if it does, and if every single state had vote by mail, if we had nationwide vote by mail, could you imagine? More people would vote. And when turnout is higher, Republicans lose. This is uh, a fact of reality. Every single election, we can basically... If we knew how many people would turn out to vote, you could predict with a relative degree of certainty which party would win and take power. So the Republican Party always tries to concern troll as a way of disenfranchising voters, right? They say we need voter ID laws to, you know, diminish the prospect of fraud. We need to make sure that we don't do mail-in voting because that could lead to people committing fraud. When in actuality, what's the outcome of these policies that they implement? I mean, look at voter ID laws. These disproportionately affect black and brown voters. So, you know, if they're going to disenfranchise voters, at least stop with the facade. Stop with this, you know, pretense that you actually care about, you know, integrity at the vote. Because that's not what you care about. You care about winning. And so if you can disenfranchise Democratic Party voters and get them to not turn out for Democrats, then this means you would win. It's the only way a minority party is able to keep being successful. Aside from the fact that, you know, the opposition party Democrats suck and people don't want to turn out anyway. But if more people turn out, Republicans lose. So, I mean, this is just, it's a despicable move, right? And if I were Gavin Newsom currently, not knowing how this is going to pan out, I would encourage, you know, Democrats in their state legislature to pass this law and, you know, codify it, send it to his desk. Because I think that, you know, signing an executive order is an important measure to take, you know, um, but you also have to make sure that you make this a law so it's permanent, so it can't be challenged. I mean, that doesn't necessarily mean that it can't be challenged. That's not to say that Republicans still wouldn't challenge it. But as many arguments from them as you could debunk, that's going to help, you know, bolster your case. Because mail-in voting is incredibly important and regardless of what donald trump and republicans say they're lying they're absolutely full of shit when they say that this leads to voter fraud because that is demonstrably untrue and if they actually cared about voter fraud they can have uh policies enacted to where they audit the votes at every single precinct at every election have a recount just automatically be triggered um if an election is within two points right if, if it's a close race there are things you can do to minimize voter fraud but it's not that big of an issue they try to make it a big issue and you know right-wing media sensationalizes this issue because they want to suppress the vote and you know uh claiming that there are widespread instances of voter fraud across the country that's just a justification that they use to try to disenfranchise voters don't fall for their bullshit and fight them because voting is a right and once you lose that right in a democracy then you no longer live in a democracy you can argue about how much impact your vote has but if you lose the right to vote if there are more obstacles that keep you from voting you no longer live in a democracy and you can already make the case that we don't live in a democracy i would argue that we don't live in a democracy or we don't meet the criteria of polyarchy but the right to vote is essential don't let donald trump lie to you don't let the republican party lie to you they are full of shit they don't care about voter fraud if they actually were concerned with it they wouldn't be pushing voter id laws or stopping people from voting by mail because again it works in oregon we've had it here for decades and republicans and democrats here love it and if you try to take it away from us uh, you're going to have a, a pretty hard time doing that, right? Even Republicans here absolutely love vote by mail.
So um, this is just a tactic. It's a ploy for them to gaslight you into thinking that voter fraud is a bigger issue than it is so they can disenfranchise you. Don't let them and fight them. So about a month or so ago on the program, we talked about how there was an effort amongst congressional Republicans to use COVID-19 to undermine Social Security. And this is something that Donald Trump and Mitch McConnell also want to do. And since Social Security is such a popular program, they can't just come out and explicitly say we want to cut Social Security or undermine Social Security. They can't even say that they want to privatize Social Security because even Republicans, Republican voters, that is, they have Social Security. They like this program, so they don't want politicians to touch it. So what they have to do is basically lie to people. Trump proposed, for example, a payroll tax cut to help people during this pandemic. Now ask yourself, why would it make sense to help people who are losing their jobs at record numbers by cutting payroll taxes? I mean, if you don't have a job, a payroll tax won't benefit you. Well, this is just a covert attempt to undermine Social Security because Social Security is a program that is funded almost disproportionately, or if not mostly, through payroll taxes. So if you cut payroll taxes, you undermine Social Security by cutting funding to it. And then once they create this problem, then they can propose solutions to fix Social Security, which leads to privatization, either fully or partial. But either way, Wall Street wants it and they are trying to deliver. So, um, you know, long story short, we talked about that effort and, you know, it hasn't gone away. It's still an issue. They're still trying to use COVID-19 to undermine Social Security and ultimately gut it by either privatizing it, whatever. And that effort is gaining momentum. And Mitt Romney is spearheading this effort because he's trying to set up these sort of uh, task forces or committees, whatever way you want to, um, you know, frame this to look at what we can do to protect Social Security at a time when it is under threat because of COVID-19. Yeah, if it sounds sketchy, it's because it is. So for more on this, we go to Jake Johnson of Common Dreams, who reports a proposal by Senator Mitt Romney to establish congressional committees with the specific goal of crafting legislative quote-unquote solutions for America's federal trust fund programs has reportedly resurfaced in GOP talks over the next COVID-19 stimulus package, sparking alarm among progressive advocates who warned the Utah Republicans' bill is nothing but a stealth attack on Social Security and Medicare. Politico's Burgess Everett reported Wednesday that Romney's trust Act, first introduced last October with the backing of a bipartisan group of senators, is getting a positive reception from Senate Republicans in coronavirus relief discussions, which are still in their early stages. The legislation, Everett noted, could become part of the mix for the next COVID stimulus package, as Republicans once again claim to be concerned about the growing budget deficit. Max Richman, president and CEO of the National Committee to Preserve Social Security and Medicare, told Common Dreams in an interview that he is not at all surprised to see Romney's bill crop up again and said it should be diligently opposed. NCPSSM vocally condemned the Trust Act when it was unveiled last year, warning that if passed, the measure would likely result in cuts to the earned benefits of seniors, people with disabilities, and survivors. Richmond noted that in a House Ways and Means Social Security Subcommittee roundtable discussion this week, the idea of establishing commissions to study possible changes to Social Security, though not Romney's bill specifically, was floated by GOP members, an indication that the New Deal era program is very much on the minds and potentially in the crosshairs of Republican lawmakers. Speaking to Politico this week, Two Republican congressmen, Representatives Tom Reed and Steve Womack, cited the coronavirus pandemic's possible effects on Social Security to call for a commission to study the program and recommended reforms. Representative John Larson, meanwhile, is pushing for an expansion of benefits funded by lifting the payroll tax cap, which would make wealthier Americans pay more. So look, let me just save them the hassle. You don't even have to create these committees. Let me just tell you what the conclusion ultimately will be. The conclusion is that Social Security is going bankrupt. And in order to save Social Security, we've got to make some changes. 
which will ultimately result in us underfunding the program, undermining its long-term health and actuality when it's not currently the case that it is going bankrupt, and then proposing a solution to the problem that they themselves created. I mean, we're kind of already seeing this, right? Because they're fear-mongering about the budget and the deficit. That's what, uh, you know, uh, Mitch McConnell and Donald Trump are using as grounds to fear-monger about, you know, uh, needing to cut Social Security. So they propose some sort of solution to a problem that doesn't actually exist, and they end up creating more problems with said solution that we didn't need them to implement in the first place. If you want to save Social Security and you want it to last for future generations, there is just one policy change that you need to make. And it was cited in this article by Representative John Larson. You just lift the cap on taxable income. Bernie Sanders talks about this, and it is the one change that you need to make if you want to protect Social Security. Period. End of story. Anything else is just going to be an effort to undermine Social Security because they know that if they just come out and say, look, we want to privatize Social Security. It's not going to last. And if you want it to be there for future generations, your children and grandchildren, then we have to privatize it. That argument holds no weight, even among Republican Party voters. Doesn't hold any weight. So what they have to do is actually drive down satisfaction because this program is very popular. So if they can cultivate dissatisfaction, by undermining the program, gutting it in ways, in roundabout ways, covert ways, then people might be more open to the idea of privatization. And they may not propose full privatization, but they at least want to start with partial privatization. And then once Wall Street gets their foot in the door, then, you know, it's a matter of time before they chip away at it and it looks nothing like it does today. So this is why whenever there is any sort of inklings that they may make an adjustment or change or fix to Social Security, we have to sound the alarm because they are constantly looking for ways to undermine Social Security. And if they're going to use COVID-19 as a justification, they don't care that it's disgusting and insidious. They're going to use just that because this is what their donors want. And think about this. They're trying to roll this into the next stimulus package, supposedly. It's still early. But the first stimulus came with a multi-trillion dollar bailout for the industry. And the second one may come with them undermining Social Security. Even during a pandemic, they're always looking out for their donors. So I want you all to remember this. Whenever there is an opportunity for Social Security to be undermined and ultimately cut, Republicans will be looking for that way out. Democrats also want to cut Social Security. They also want to deliver for their Wall Street donors. Obama tried to do this, but Bernie Sanders is the one who actually stopped him from cutting Social Security. So, you know, you have to be vigilant because both parties want to cut Social Security. But Democrats are a lot more tactical when it comes to cutting Social Security. They try to do it when they're in power and try to, you know, pass it as a negotiation with Republicans so they can argue that their hands were tied, like how Obama didn't want to raise, you know, uh, the cost of living give uh, Social Security recipients that raise, which amounts to a cut over time. Uh, but Republicans, they're just always, they don't, they don't care if they're in power or not. They're always looking for a way to undermine Social Security. And you have to be hyper vigilant. You have to always sound the alarm because if you back down just for a second, they're going to do it. And that's a damn shame. Trump wants to do it. Mitch McConnell wants to do it. And we can't let them. We have to stop them. So um, this is disgusting. Mitt Romney's Trust Act isn't about anything but gutting Social Security. We don't need to study what we need to do to protect Social Security. The answer is very simple. You just lift the cap so rich people can pay into it as well. There's no reason to stop people who make higher incomes from paying into Social Security. That doesn't make any sense, right? They're going to get it too, right? It's a universal program. So why should they not be paying into it? So that's it. Anyone who proposes anything else is um, lying to you. They're trying to deceive you because they ultimately want to gut Social Security and privatize it for their donors. And we can't let them. We cannot let them. We have to fight them because they're going to do it if we don't fight them at every step of the way. Even though the left and anti-establishment candidates lost during the 2020 Democratic Party primary, we got some really fantastic leaders that emerged out of this process. And even if I had policy disagreements with individuals like Marianne Williamson and Andrew Yang, the work that they're doing for the progressive movement 
it's showing how invaluable they are to not just the movement, but to the country. So last week we talked about how Marianne Williamson endorsed primary challengers to members of Democratic Party leadership. She endorsed Michaela Wilkes running against Steny Hoyer and Shahid Buttar running, of course, against Nancy Pelosi. And she also has endorsed, you know, a plethora of other congressional candidates such as Eva Putsova and whatnot. So that's so important because these candidates oftentimes lose because they don't have name recognition. And when you're trying to build a campaign based on grassroots, getting recognized by people with, you know, these large platforms with millions of followers, that is so valuable. So I gave Marianne Williamson a lot of credit for that. And now I'm going to give Andrew Yang a lot of credit because him, along with his organization, Humanity Forward, have also been endorsing a lot of really solid congressional candidates. And two of them that he just endorsed are Jen Perlman running in Florida's 23rd congressional district against Debbie Wasserman Schultz, as well as uh, Russ Sirincione who's running against Frank Pallone. So first of all, Jen Perlman tweeted out, we are thrilled to be endorsed today by Andrew Yang. His humanity first approach to politics mirrors what our service-based campaign is all about. Let's unseat Washerman Schultz together, Yang Gang. And she includes a quote from Andrew Yang, which says, Jen Perlman is first and foremost an activist. She was born and raised in Florida where she attended marches and protests with her parents growing up. Today, she uses her law degree to protect voting rights, defend women's reproductive health and help people navigate the criminal justice system all pro bono her campaign events are all volunteer service events a gen victory would truly be cause for celebration i am proud to endorse her and when it comes to russ sirincione running in new jersey's sixth congressional district he writes today it is with great honor that i announce the russ for us 2020 campaign has received the endorsement of andrew yang and humanity forward and along with that tweet, he included this video where he announces the endorsement of Andrew Yang. Hey everybody, this is Russ Cerincioni. I'm running for Congress in New Jersey. And I'm so happy and I'm super thankful to share that I'm endorsed by Humanity Forward and Andrew Yang. Because we really need math, the facts, the data to guide us. And Humanity Forward knows these values are true. As a millennial, we're known for changing the rules of the game and shaking things up. It's time to build an economy that puts people first, that meets all of our basic human needs. With 40 million jobs lost because of COVID, we need a federal jobs guarantee and a universal basic income for every single person. We can do things better as a nation and live up to our full potential. My name is Russ Serencioni. I'm running for Congress in New Jersey 6th. Go to my website at russforus2020.com. So that's fantastic. Listen, these endorsements are absolutely crucial. I cannot stress that enough. If you are running for Congress and you have zero name recognition and not very much money and you're going up against a behemoth of an incumbent, these endorsements are everything. Members of the Yang Gang and people who follow Andrew Yang, the millions of followers that he has, are learning about Jen Perlman and Russ Sirsione for the first time because of Andrew Yang. He has nothing to gain by making these endorsements, but you can tell he's endorsing these people because he cares about them. And think about this. Debbie Wasserman Schultz is one of the most notoriously anti-left, anti-progressive members of Congress. In case you forgot, she rigged an entire presidential primary against the left in 2016. So this person has got to lose her job. And putting that aside, putting aside 2016, her record is atrocious. She doesn't support Medicare for all. And in the case of Frank Pallone in New Jersey's sixth con congressional district, he sits on a powerful committee that can ensure that we never get Medicare for all. So these are individuals who absolutely must be defeated. And for Andrew Yang to endorse the primary challengers to prominent Democrats, he's making waves. And this actually, you could argue, hurts him. It hurts him going forward because assuming he's going to run for president again in 2024 or 2028, you know, you ideally want to make inroads with the Democratic Party. This was Elizabeth Warren's key strategy, right? You butter up members of the establishment and you get them to like you. Andrew Yang is pissing off people here. 
So whenever you see a politician or a public figure endorse someone who's challenging an incumbent Democrat, I need you to acknowledge that takes a level of courage that other politicians are not exhibiting. This is big. This is substantial. And I'm very thankful that Andrew Yang and his organization are making these endorsements because honestly, these endorsements, like I'm not going to say that they're make or break, but it gives people running these races that are difficult a lot of momentum. And hopefully that momentum will kind of turn into this snowball effect, right? So this is fantastic. Uh, some of these people, uh, Jen Perlman has been uh, endorsed by Marianne Williamson and Andrew Yang. I don't know about Russ, but I will say that all of these endorsements of congressional candidates is really, really important because even if the left and the anti-establishment uh, in general, just if you think of them as a block, even though we all lost collectively, I mean, we still have a lot of races that matter to us. We may have lost the presidency, but if we can actually knock out a few prominent Democrats who are holding us back, I mean, that would be huge. It would be a boost that our movement needs. So this is why, you know, you never want to focus on one race. You know, politics isn't just about electoral politics. It's mostly about organizing. But when you do focus on electoral politics, you know, the presidency isn't everything. And I say this knowing the irony as someone, you know, who focused almost exclusively on the presidential election. But, you know, it's tough not to when we're this close to power. But, you know, we have to recenter ourselves from time to time and acknowledge what's really important. And it's these congressional races where we can still make a difference, where we can have an impact. And I'm so thankful that leaders like Andrew Yang and Marion Williamson are continuing to show us that they are dedicated. They didn't just run for a vanity project or because they wanted a book deal. They ran because they believed in something. And that really is rare in politics. So whenever I see a politician, even if I don't necessarily agree with them on everything, pop up that actually is principled, you know, I value them because that is rare nowadays. In the 5th Congressional District of Maryland, Steny Hoyer is the individual who currently holds that seat. He represents that district. And the bad news about Steny Hoyer is that he is next in line to be the Speaker of the House once Nancy Pelosi leaves. And as much as we all don't like Nancy Pelosi on the left, Steny Hoyer is actually worse than Nancy Pelosi. He's actually more conservative than Nancy Pelosi, more hostile towards the left than Nancy Pelosi, which is almost unthinkable because when you think about neoliberal and centrist hostility towards the left, I mean, Nancy Pelosi embodies that. But everything that we've seen based on his record, based on his rhetoric, Steny Hoyer will be worse than Nancy Pelosi. So we have to do everything in our power. I cannot stress this enough. Everything to stop that man from becoming speaker. And there's only one surefire way to do just that. Kick him out. Oust him. Launch a primary challenge against him. And kick him to the curb. Now, he actually does have a primary challenger. That's the good news. Her name is Michaela Wilkes, and I actually brought her on my program a couple of months ago. And this is a difficult race. Like, any time you are challenging leadership, that's a David and Goliath situation. And I know that we may feel a little bit emboldened because we were able to oust a leader, a future House Speaker, when AOC took down Joe Crowley. But this is a really difficult task. This is... <laughs> Look, we've got our work cut out for us. But the great news is that Michaela Wilkes is gaining so much steam that Steny Hoyer is officially worried. And we know that he's worried for the first time in decades because he's actually having to campaign. You see, whenever there's a primary challenger against members of Democratic Party leadership, they have so much clout in that district, so much money, that they don't even acknowledge the existence and run ads of, you know, uh, their primary challengers or anything like that because they just know that they're going to win automatically. But guess what? Steny Hoyer is forced to campaign because of Michaela Wilkes, because of the amazing campaign that she is running. And her campaign manager tweeted out this. Steny Hoyer just made a $30,000 TV ad buy spanning five regions. This is unprecedented for a primary race in his 40-year tenure. Michaela Wilkes clearly has him nervous. Hoyer's got money. Michaela Wilkes has people. And as you can see, they posted the report here. 
he is choosing to advertise on, surprise, surprise, MSNBC between 7 p.m. to midnight. Now, you may see that and think, well, it's only $30,000. And, you know, that makes sense to think that that's not very much because we just watched uh, a billionaire Michael Bloomberg spend a billion dollars almost of his own money, you know, buying ads across the country. But in a congressional race, $30,000 for an incumbent, that's that's a lot. That's a lot of money. And it does show you that she's starting to break through. She has a real chance to actually defeat him. And I want to show you why I think it's the case that her campaign is gaining momentum. She put out an ad in April and she has this pinned to her Twitter page. And this really shows you who she is and why Steny Hoyer is so bad. And this is by far one of the best ads I've seen throughout this election cycle. So take a look at the ad and we'll discuss it when we come back. When I was about nine years old, we moved to Charles County here in Waldorf. My family played a huge part in my life. My dad was murdered while my mother was pregnant with me. And so my aunts and my mom were my support system. Growing up, my aunt, her name's Sharon Carver, we were just so close. I was in math class. We had a substitute teacher. The sub turned on the TV. What she was watching were airplanes crashing into the World Trade Center. I went home and I'll never forget, my mom was in the living room watching the news. When I looked at the TV, I was like, isn't that where Aunt Sharon works? I began to run away from home. I began to skip school because I didn't know how to deal with what I was dealing with. What I needed was someone to talk to and what I received was being shackled and taken away to a juvenile detention facility. This was bigger than the individual. Like it's so much bigger than the people that get in trouble. It's the system that catches them when they get in trouble. I wasn't always interested in politics because I didn't see any politicians speaking about issues that were important to my community. No one was knocking on my door. No one was calling my phone. Then in 2018, I saw people like AOC running for Congress. We can run as regular people and we can speak truth to power to these issues that are hurt in our communities and we can win. Single mother of two is taking on the second most powerful Democrat in the House. Steny Hoyer takes money from corporations that profit off of the most vulnerable, marginalized people in our community. And I know this because I'm one of them. We are, of course, on this floor now considering a major comprehensive drug bill. This is someone who signed every single crime bill that has been put into place that has helped to contribute to the mass incarceration crisis. This is someone who refuses to believe that we should act on climate change now and support a Green New Deal. This is someone who works with the very corporations that profit off of our pain. What we have at stake is actually having affordable housing. What we have at stake is actually providing jobs that provide livable wages. I'm fighting for Medicare for all. I'm fighting for a Green New Deal. I'm fighting for a restorative, more holistic approach to criminal justice reform. One that is fair to everyone and not just those who can afford it. We are going up against someone powerful, someone who is backed by the machine, but we have to show them that we have the people. Those who have been affected by legislation, those who are closest to the pain. That is who runs this movement. It's us, it's me, it's you, it's regular people, not the corporations and not the politicians who profit from it. I'm asking each of you to join this movement with me. A vote for me is a vote for us. Wow. Listen, watching that ad, something just kind of clicked with me. If enough people in that district, if every single person in that district saw this ad and knew who Michaela Wilkes was, she'd win handily. In fact, I'd argue that if every single person who was going to vote saw that ad before casting their vote, she would win in a landslide because the difference between her and Steny Hoyer is like night and day. He hasn't just been not representing the people of Maryland's 5th Congressional District. He's been doing damage to their community. 
damage to communities of color, supporting mass incarceration and whatnot. So that ad is so good that if people saw it, she could win. And here's the thing about these races. Even though oftentimes primary challenges are not successful, statistically speaking, it just takes more time. It takes more name recognition. And in every single one of these races, I truly believe to my core that all it takes to win is we educate enough people. Enough people have to know about the choice that they have. And I think nine times out of 10, they're going to go for that progressive option. They're going to go for the person who's actually hungry to represent them. I truly believe that. And we really do have our work cut out for us. I don't want you to make it, I don't, I don't want to um, make it seem as if this is going to be an easy race. And because he's purchasing $30,000 worth of ads, you know, it's over. No, I mean, COVID-19 has really been a huge obstacle to all of these grassroots campaigns because knocking on doors is their bread and butter. So they basically have to rely almost exclusively on phone banking, which isn't everything. I mean, making those personal connections with future constituents, that matters. So, you know, this isn't over. I don't want you to think that, you know, Michaela Wilkes has this in the bag. But what I want you to take away from this is that there's a real opportunity. These primary challenges, they're not, you know, lost causes. They're not always going to be a foregone conclusion. Most of the time, when we mount these challenges against incumbent Democrats, you know, our side isn't successful. But, you know, as AOC said in the documentary, um, Knocking Down the House, it takes a hundred of them to win or to run in order for one of them to win. And with the way that some of these primary races are going, where you have people like Steny Hoyer and Nancy Pelosi with Shahid Buttar challenging her, actually being forced to campaign, that is a phenomenal, phenomenal sign. So Michaela Wilkes can win this race. And I know it seems like that's an impossible thought currently because the left just lost the biggest race of our lifetimes with the Democratic Party primary and Bernie Sanders, but it's not over. And there's still a lot of wins that we can rack up in 2020. We've got a long way to go and her primary is coming up. So I'm going to link you to the interview that I did with Michaela Wilkes. And I want to encourage you to donate to her campaign. I know that everyone is hurting right now. I know that, you know, we're losing our jobs and our livelihoods because of COVID-19. But if you have anything to spare, a dollar, that can make a difference because she's got Steny Hoyer on the ropes. We just need to give her enough momentum to land that knockout punch. It's going to be hard. But it is possible. It is within the realm of possibility. Don't tell yourself it's not possible. Michaela Wilkes has been campaigning now for over a year, and she has a phenomenal strategy. She's running a good campaign. She has a solid team, and she could do this. Don't just believe it. Fight for it. But acknowledge it's possible. By now, I'm sure you've seen the absolutely horrific viral video of four police officers in Minneapolis, Minnesota, murdering a black man named George Floyd. And as one of the officers had his knee on George Floyd's neck, he was crying out, I can't breathe. You've got your knee on my neck. And he started crying for his mom. And as this man begged for his life, as people who were watching this take place begged and pleaded with the police officers, to let him up because they were killing him, they were completely stone-faced. They had no emotions. They didn't care that they were literally killing somebody. This was a murder. This was a murder, and we have to call it what it was. This wasn't an officer-involved killing, as some politicians want to describe it. This was a murder, a cold-blooded murder that we all saw with our very eyes. And the police officers were fired once they started to, uh, the police department sensed public backlash that was growing, but that's not enough. Murderers don't get to go free. Murderers should be charged. And, you know, anyone who watched this video, who saw the callousness on these police officers' faces, were struck by it, but if you talk to any black American, this isn't surprising to them. This happens every single day, and they know how little the cops view them, right? They don't view them as human beings. They dehumanized black Americans. They harass and target black communities. 
And it's just, it, it keeps happening. But at what point are we as a society going to stop this from happening? You would think that the prevalence of this would maybe decrease because everyone basically has a camcorder in their pocket. They can film these instances. So you think that maybe that would be some sort of check, but it's not at all. I mean, people were literally filming this police officer and re he refused to take his knee off of this man's neck. He didn't care that the world was inevitably going to see this. He did not care. They don't care. They don't value black lives. And so the story is just, it's gut-wrenching. And it keeps ha happening, and it's going to continue to happen until we do something about this and we stop this from happening. America is so fucked up. But here's the thing, it's, it's not like this is a new phenomenon. It's always been this way. The difference is that now we can see it. Now we can see these things happen. Now white America gets clued in on what's been happening to black America since the founding of this country. It's fucking disgusting. So there's no words to really you know, uh, close out this story. There's no great flowery rhetoric that I can use about us coming together and fighting this. I mean, how can you not just be completely fucking disgusted by this? How could you not watch that video in horror and just completely lose all sense of hope in America and in the world that they just killed this man not even caring? Completely stone-faced, not caring that they are murdering someone in broad daylight with cameras on them, and they don't care. They don't care at all. Completely ap apathetic, ambivalent. Unbelievable. Now, we got newly released surveillance footage confirming that there was no signs that George Floyd was resisting arrest. They can't try to make it seem as if he was doing anything wrong in this instance, or that the police officers' lives were threatened. That certainly wasn't the case. And we're now hearing from the family of George Floyd. His sister, Bridget Floyd, called on the four police officers to be charged with murder, rightfully so. And in an interview with CNN's Don Lemon, his brother and other family members also called for the police officers to be charged with murder because they committed murder. Take a look. The four officers involved have been fired. Uh, which the mayor of Minneapolis said was the, the right call. But is that enough for your family, Philonies? No, not at all. I love my brother. Everybody loves my brother. Knowing my brother is to love my brother. They could have tased him. They could have maced him. Instead, they, would, they put their knee in his neck and just sat on him and didn't care at all. He screamed, mama, mama, I can't breathe. I can't breathe. And they didn't care. So I don't, I don't, I just don't understand what more we got to go through in life, man. They didn't have to do that to him. He's a jump giant. He don't hurt anybody. He give his last to anybody. They didn't care. They treated him worse than they treat animals. And I wouldn't have like that. They took a life, now they deserve life. I don't feel sorry for them. They hurt me and they hurt my family. I can't take nothing back. I can't get my brother back. They at home, they sleep, they with their wives, they got kids. If something like that happened to them, they'll be just like me. I just don't know what's going on now. So firing them is 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 a good start, but we want to see justice for our family and um, we want to see them charged. We want to have them arrested. They need to be charged with because what they did was, was murder. And almost the whole world has witnessed that because somebody was gracious enough mm -hmm. to report it. Mm. Um, the the uh, connection, we lost it for a second. You said you want to see them charged. At, did you say charged with murder? Is that what you said? We want to see them charged with murder. murder. And we want them to be convicted. We want them arrested. They need to pay for what they did. Um, he didn't deserve what happened to him. And they didn't do anything to help him. They were supposed to be there to serve 
and to protect. And I didn't see a single one of them lift a finger to do anything to help. While he was begging for his life, not one of them tried to do anything to help him. That I didn't see. What I did see was murder. And that's what I want them to be arrested and charged and convicted mm -hmm. for. My heart goes out to them, but I mean saying that is meaningless because no flowery rhetoric, as I stated, is going to, you know, bring him back. It's not going to get justice in this situation. So there's no words really that are profound enough to like resonate with anyone that would make the situation better. This is just disgusting. And that's that's it. Now, you know, um, there were a lot of protests that erupted and the police officers responded as you expected them to respond with riot gear, throwing tear gas at the protesters who were rightfully outraged at the fact that the individuals who are supposed to protect and serve murdered someone in cold blood in their community. Now, I'm going to have another video coming up where we kind of contrast the response to the police uh, with the Minneapolis protesters and, you know, the protests that we saw just a few weeks ago from anti-quarantine protesters who were literally getting up in the faces of police officers screaming. It's a double standard. You can't exist in America if you're black. Anything that you're doing, no matter how innocent it may be, you are always under threat that the police may kill you. What kind of a fucked up world is that? How can we let this happen and sit idly by and you know just try to put it out of our minds and move on to the next one once it inevitably happens and you know forget about the last one we're seeing modern day lynching lynchings happen and the outrage just isn't there i mean sure this is a story that everyone is compelled by it's a viral video but we're seeing modern day lynchings why aren't we proper taking the proper action? I don't know what to say. There, there's nothing to say in this instance. It's going to keep happening unless we put a stop to it, unless we actually change this country. So that's that. Another black man was murdered by police officers. After an unarmed black man named George Floyd was murdered by four police officers in Minneapolis, Minnesota, protests broke out across the United States. And surprisingly, police officers remained relatively calm as people demanded justice for George Floyd. As you can see from this video here, armed protesters actually stormed the state capitol in Michigan demanding justice for George Floyd. And in California, protesters were actually confronting cops directly, getting in their faces, screaming in their faces, and demanding justice for George Floyd. Or wait, hang on a second. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm getting word from my producer that I mixed up the footage. I made a mistake. That was not footage from the protests regarding George Floyd. That was protests that took place a couple of weeks ago. Right-wing protests of armed thugs demanding that states reopen. So the footage that I'm going to show you, this is actually footage from Minneapolis where police officers responded in a more predictable manner. So these are photos from Star Tribune's Carlos Gonzalez. And OK, this is what I expected. We see police officers in riot gear, shooting rubber bullets, uh, throwing tear gas. This uh, makes a lot more sense. So the police didn't apparently feel intimidated or threatened or the need for riot gear when armed thugs stormed the Capitol building in Michigan, or when people were yelling in their faces in California, but in Minneapolis, as people demand justice for the murder of George Floyd, now they feel threatened. Now, if you've been watching the news, you know, there's uh, various, I, I think probably dozens of live streams of what's taking place in Minneapolis currently on YouTube, but you can't really characterize this all with a broad brush, right? Some of the protests are leading to riots and looting, whereas a lot of people are just marching and demanding justice, specifically demanding for the murderer of George Floyd, murderers specifically, to be charged and arrested.
But, you know, because there were many instances of rioting and looting, conservatives took issue with this. They didn't say very much about how maybe the right-wing protesters went a little bit far storming the state capitol with guns. But in this instance, they're very concerned about the behavior of the people who are rebelling in Minneapolis. For example, Tommy Loren clutched her pearls at the looting, tweeting, if you smash and bang on cop cars, riot and burn flags in the streets and loot your community businesses, you are not a protester. You are part of the problem. Is this really how you bring justice? Is this how you honor his life? Now, I should note that at the time she made that tweet, she made precisely zero tweets about George Floyd. Zero tweets demanding justice for George Floyd. So let's not pretend as if Tommy Loren cares about honoring his life. She doesn't care. But the point is that she wants these people to voice their grievances in a more respectable manner, in a more peaceful manner, if you will, right? Well, no, actually, because if you actually do try to draw attention to police brutality in the way that Colin Kaepernick did, and you kneel during the Pledge of Allegiance, National Anthem, She's going to take issue with that as well. Here's what she said about a city official who chose to kneel during the Pledge of Allegiance. I think what she's doing is disrespectful. I think also we have to remember that just because she has the right doesn't make her right. So she's outraged when you protest peacefully, but she's also outraged when you riot. It's almost as if she doesn't want you to speak up when you're mad about the fact that police officers across the country are murdering unarmed black Americans with impunity. She just wants you to be quiet. But she's not alone because Charlie Kirk also clutched his pearls and he tweeted, if you burn a city to the ground to riot against injustice, you should be arrested and thrown in prison. Now, I checked his timeline and I didn't see any tweets uh, talking about what he thinks the penalty should be for murder. But if you riot, you should definitely be arrested. If you uh, murder an unarmed black civilian, eh, he doesn't really care about that. It's the rioting that's the biggest issue in his opinion. Now, America's biggest bootlicker, Andy No, snitched on Ilhan Omar's daughter for committing the unspeakable crime of retweeting the Twin Cities DSA, who asked for supplies needed to shield and treat people who have been harmed by police abuse. Now, I know what you're thinking. Yeah, my conservatives are hypocrites. I get it. But shouldn't we, as responsible leftists, actually condemn this behavior that we're seeing, condemn the looting? Well, my response to that is sure. And I'm going to take the time to condemn looting right now. Quote, American billionaires got $434 billion richer during the pandemic. As Michael Brooks put it, this is looting, and I condemn this. Uh, this is a photo of Kelly Loeffler. She is a United States senator who, along with some of her colleagues, including Richard Burr, Dianne Feinstein, dumped their stocks before the market tanked after they were briefed on COVID-19. As Blaine puts it, she is a looter, and I absolutely unequivocally condemn her and the behavior of her colleagues. This photograph includes images of some of the world's biggest, most notorious looters. It includes billionaires like Jeff Bezos, Mark Zuckerberg, Bill Gates, one of the Koch brothers, and these individuals are all looters who looted the wealth that they now control. They stole the wealth and now they were able to use the wealth that they've accumulated to buy political capital to influence politicians to make them even richer. I absolutely condemn these looters. And there's a lot more instances of looting that I want to condemn here. Quote, wealthiest hospitals got billions in bailout for struggling health providers. Bonanza for rich real estate investors tucked into stimulus package. Airlines got the sweetest coronavirus bailout around. Large troubled companies got bailout money and small business loan program. Stealth bailout shovels millions of dollars to oil companies. And as David Sirota points out, these are all instances of looting and I wholeheartedly condemn all of them. So yes, all of those instances that I just listed are bad. Oh, okay. So you wanted me to actually talk about the rioting and the looting. Um, here's the thing. I don't actually consider what protesters in Minneapolis are doing as rioting or looting. As Mark Lamont Hill puts it, these are rebellions. This isn't random or irrational violence. This is organized resistance to an evil system that only pays attention when it feels financially or physically unsafe. This is how we feel every day. Exactly. 
This is a response, this uprising, this rebellion is a response to sustained oppression and tyranny. State-sanctioned murders cannot happen. They can't keep happening. So this is a community who is exhausted and fed up, rising up and saying, enough is, en is enough. So I don't view this as some irrational act of civil disobedience. This is a rebellion. These people are demanding change. And if that change is not going to come, then they're going to make everyone in society feel uncomfortable until everyone feels compelled to listen to them and take action ultimately. And all of this could end like that if the murderers who killed George Floyd, we all saw the video, were arrested. But do you want to know what happened instead? Rather than marching to his house and arresting their colleague, dozens, if not hundreds of police officers stood in front of his house to protect him. None of them chose to go into his house and put handcuffs on him. Instead, they chose to protect him. So if you are choosing to just dismiss this as a riot of people, you know, not being respectable, not doing what's right for the movement, respectability politics has not gotten us anywhere. It hasn't gotten us anywhere. And these protesters feel like they are left with no other choices. They have to make noise. They have to rebel like this openly because you weren't paying attention to them when they were peacefully protesting. In fact, a lot of the conservatives we talked about denounced them. Trump called Colin Kaepernick a son of a bitch and said that he should be fired for taking a knee during the national anthem. So you weren't listening to them when they were trying to be peaceful. So now you don't get to complain that they are using the last method that they have rebellion to stop these types of murders from taking place. And I will leave you with the wise words of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, this is a video shared by Isaiah James, who was a 2020 congressional candidate from New York. This is what we need to know about what's taking place in Minneapolis. I think we've got to see that a riot is the language of the unheard. Tucker Carlson of Fox News decided to respond to what is taking place in Minneapolis currently, and his commentary was uh, predictable, but take a look and I will respond afterwards. So that's what rioting looks like. It happened last night, as you can see, it's happening right now. We want to be clear, we're not showing you these pictures to defend the behavior of individuals on the Minneapolis Police Department. We're not. We're defending society itself. Rioting is the one thing you don't want ugly opinions, police brutality, officious bird watchers, rude entitled ladies walking their dogs in big city parks. All of that is bad, but none of it is nearly as bad as what you just saw. The indiscriminate use of violence by mobs is a threat to every American of all colors and backgrounds and political beliefs. Democracy cannot exist when people are rioting. Rioting is a form of tyranny. The strong and the violent oppress the weak and the unarmed. It is oppression. Now, some of you may not necessarily be that politically savvy, and instinctively you might agree with what he had to say. But in case you didn't notice it, let me point it out for you. Whatever he said, the opposite is actually true. The power dynamic that he's describing, he flipped it. What he said, the opposite is true. It's like if I told you that I'm not actually the host of The Humanist Report, you're the host of The Humanist Report. Yes, you watching this, and I'm actually the viewer. That is the level of absurdity that we're talking about here. And maybe you still aren't convinced. You have this visceral reaction to the rebellion that's taking place in Minneapolis. But let me ask you this. Which Tucker Carlson do you agree with more when it comes to protests? Do you agree with the Tucker Carlson that we just heard from? Or do you agree more with this Tucker Carlson? This is America. We're allowed to disagree with what our leaders do however we like. And we're allowed to express that disagreement in public. That's our birthright. I mean, it kind of sounds like he's doing a 180. Does it not? Let me read that quote back to you. This is America. We're allowed to disagree with what our leaders do however we like. And we're allowed to express our disagreement in public. It's our birthright. So the question to Tucker is, which is it? Are we allowed to publicly disagree with government however we like, as you put it? 
or are there restrictions in the way that we are able to engage in civil disobedience? What's the parameters? Lay it out for us, Einstein, because you weren't very specific there. You just condemned the protesters. But let's go back to some of what he said in that first clip. So the first thing he says is we're defending society itself. Rioting is the one thing you don't want. Now, when he says that, is he trying to convince you that rioting isn't good for you? Or is he trying to convince us that rioting isn't actually good for the state? Furthermore, he says, the indiscriminate use of violence by mobs is a threat to every American. Is it actually a threat to every American or is it a threat to the establishment, to the powers that be? Because when society collapses because the people are fed up and they take to the streets, something that we saw with the Yellow Vest movement in France, for example, that forces the powers that be to respond. So who actually does the rioting pose a threat to in actuality, Tucker? Does it pose a threat to normal citizens or the establishment, the capitalist overlords? He also says, democracy cannot exist when people are rioting. Probably the most absurd thing that he said here. Rioting is a form of tyranny. The strong and the violent oppress the weak and the unarmed. It is oppression. So there's no way that he believes what he just said. There's no way. Because if he believed that, he would be so idiotic, have such a juvenile understanding of political definitions that he wouldn't be able to be a competent political commentator. But he knows what he's doing. But let's go over some of these definitions. The definition of tyranny reads cruel and oppressive government or rule a nation under cruel and oppressive government cruel unreasonable or arbitrary use of power or control ask yourself this does that sound more like the state and police officers arms of the state murdering unarmed civilians or does that sound more like the people who are protesting that injustice we know what it sounds like we know what tyranny means also, when it comes to oppression, it is prolonged, cruel, or unjust treatment or control. A state of being subject to unjust treatment or control. Are the people rebelling in Minneapolis the ones who are subjecting the state to cruel and unjust control? Or is the state the one that is subjecting them to cruel and unjust control, hence why they are rebelling and protesting? So do you understand what he did here? He completely flipped what's happening here. In response to tyranny and oppression, he calls the people the tyrants and the oppressors, rather than the state itself, rather than saying, you know, these people are speaking up against tyranny and oppression. He takes the power dynamic here and he reverses it. He says it's actually the protesters who are the ones who are doing tyranny and oppressing rather than the state oppressing them. So here's the thing. You can choose to use whatever political terms you want to describe situations, but you don't get to redefine their meanings. I think that it is important to point out the inherent tyranny and oppress oppression with this story, but you don't get to attribute, you know, uh, who the oppressor is if you don't even know how power dynamics work. It's the state who's the oppressor. It's the four police officers who murdered an unarmed black man. These are entities of the state. This is a state-sanctioned murder of a civilian. The people speaking up and rebelling, they're not the ones who are carrying out the oppression and the tyranny. They are speaking out against oppression and tyranny. But see, for Tucker Carlson, it's only oppression and tyranny if a democratic governor imposes some sort of policy that right-wingers don't like. So if Gretchen Whitmer is going to say, how about this, we're extending the lockdown for another two weeks and people storm the Michigan Capitol with guns, that's perfectly reasonable. That is exactly what we're allowed to do. We're allowed to disagree with what our leaders do however we like. But in this instance, we're not allowed to disagree however we like if we're actually calling out a real form of tyranny. Telling people that they should social distance and wear masks, that's not an actual form of tyranny. Murdering human beings, that is a form of tyranny. That is oppression. So Tucker Carlson is trying to use 
the language of populists. He's trying to speak as if he's a revolutionary when in actuality he is a bootlicker. He is a state propagandist trying to do everything in his power to quell this rebellion and uprising so he can protect the establishment that enriches him. That's what this is about. Don't trust this propagandist. He's lying to you. I'm inclined to say that Donald Trump is becoming even more unhinged than he usually is, but, you know, that really isn't shocking to anyone. I think it'd be more surprising if he actually acted like a functioning adult for at least a day. But lately, he really has been more stupid than usual, for lack of a better word. I mean, I don't, I don't know what to describe it. We need some, you know new words to describe what's happening. The current vocabulary just doesn't do it justice. So, as many of you know, he has been raging against mail-in voting. Not because this actually will lead to fraud, as he claims, but because if more people vote, if mail-in voting increases voter turnout, that means he probably will lose, because Democrats always win when people show up to vote, and Republicans lose. So he's banking on people staying home and feeling demoralized and not voting or not being able to overcome the obstacles to vote in order for him to get reelected. And here's what he tweeted out. There is no way, zero, that mail-in ballots will be anything less than substantially fraudulent. Mailboxes will be robbed. Ballots will be forged and even illegally printed out and fraudulently signed. The governor of California is sending ballots to millions of people. Anyone living in the state, no matter who they are or how they got there, will get one. That will be followed up with professionals telling all of these people, many of whom have never even thought of voting before, how and for whom to vote. This will be a rigged election. No way. Now, he's trying to prime you to think that mail-in voting will lead to fraud specifically because it will enable undocumented residents to vote, but that's not going to happen. You will not get a ballot mailed to you unless you are a registered voter. If you are not a citizen, you cannot become a registered voter. So he's fear-mongering, but one thing that you may not have noticed about that tweet is that Twitter actually put a little disclaimer with a link saying get the facts about mail-in ballots, which leads to a headline which reads, Trump makes unsubstantiated claim that mail-in ballots will lead to voter fraud. So they fact-checked him, and they also explained in a tweet, we added a label to two real Donald Trump tweets about California's vote-by-mail plan as part of our efforts to enforce our civic integrity policy. We believe those tweets could confuse voters about what they need to do to receive a ballot and participate in the election process. So, uh, yeah, simply put, they fact-checked him. And in response to said fact-checking, Donald Trump was apoplectic. He was enraged. He tweeted out, Twitter is now interfering... <laughs> In the 2020 presidential election, they are saying my statement on mail-in ballots, which will lead to massive corruption and fraud, which he presented no evidence for, is incorrect, based on fact-checking by fake news CNN and the Amazon Washington Post. Twitter is completely stifling free speech, and I, as president, will not allow it to happen. Yes, you heard that correctly. The president of the United States accused a private company of violating his First Amendment rights. You're not dreaming. This is real life. This is the dystopian future that we never thought we'd all see, but we're living it now. But he wasn't done there. As Variety reported, Trump is signing an executive order that would let U.S. citizens submit complaints if they feel they have been unfairly treated by social networks. So he's going to make it easier for us to speak to the managers of these social networks and uh, voice our grievances. And you know, I for one am all for it because I have a grievance with YouTube. Please stop deprioritizing independent media in favor of cable news like Fox News and CNN and MSNBC. But he's not done yet. <laughs> There's even more. So as NBC News reporter Sahil Kapoor reports, President Trump says he would shut down Twitter if his lawyers found a way to do it, but there are hurdles. I'd have to go through a legal process, he says, per White House poll report. And let's take it back to the beginning. All of this, this entire kerfuffle, is because <laughs> he's mad that they fact-checked him. That's it. They fact-checked him, and he wants to shut down Twitter. Donald Trump is the ultimate Karen. He should take that comb over 
and just let it hang down like in front of his eye, like the Karen haircut, um, because he is the ultimate Karen. Now, look, there is a conversation to be had about whether or not social media websites should engage in fact checking because that doesn't necessarily mean that they will be unbiased. I mean, for example, you have Facebook hiring a fact checker of the Daily Caller, which I personally don't trust, but that's a different conversation for a different day. The fact is they fact checked him and in this instance, you know, they were correct and he didn't like it. But guess what? Stop making shit up. He has been absolutely on a rampage against mail-in voting, and all he has is fear-mongering. He can't present evidence because this is not a widespread issue, and he sent out this bizarre email to people, which reads, We need to make one thing clear. There is no way that universal mail-in ballots will be anything less than substantially fraudulent. Mailboxes will be robbed, ballots will be illegally printed out and forged, and the election will be rigged. But that's just what the Democrats want, isn't it? They know they can't possibly beat President Trump, so their only path forward is through voter fraud so that they can try to steal the election. Yeah, so again, I'm inclined to say that he's losing it, but that would mean nothing. It wouldn't adequately describe, like, <laughs> anything different than what we've been seeing. But let's go to his concerns here. Mailboxes will be robbed, ballots will be illegally printed out and forged. Listen, I've said this once, I'll say it again. I live in Oregon. We have had vote by mail here for decades, and this has not happened. If you go to the Heritage Foundation's website, which you should never do, but if you did check out their cataloging of voter fraud and instances of voter fraud individually at the state level, for Oregon, they have, what, 13 instances of voter fraud that has happened over the course of 20 years. Would you call that a widespread problem? Because I wouldn't. And it's not that easy. Like, you can't just forge these types of ballots because what we do is we'll get it mailed to us, right? And it comes with an envelope. And in that envelope, before you can put your ballot in there, there's another little envelope and you have to sign that envelope before you um, before you mail it off. There's so much that you have to do that if you actually wanted to affect an election, that trying to rig the election by forging ballots, that's more work than finding some other way to actually fuck with the election. Like if you chose to uh, theoretically tamper with the machines that count the ballots that are mailed in, you'd be more effective that way. And when it comes to people robbing mailboxes, I mean, that is a federal offense. If you rob a mailbox, if you go into somebody's mailbox and take their mail, that is a federal offense. So if that were going to be something that happens, don't you think that it would have already been happening in states like Oregon that have mail-in voting? And here's the thing. If somebody hypothetically chose to steal my envelope in my mailbox and take my ballot um i could just request a new one and sure they can they can fill it out and forge my signature and all that but again the steps to commit voter fraud here i mean think about this people don't even think that their vote matters in this country right like people have checked out of the system 100 million americans don't even vote so they don't feel like their one vote matters so why would people if they truly wanted to rig an election or affect change politically illegally do something like that which would be the least effective way of rigging an election ever it just doesn't make sense it doesn't make sense now i would be happy to stand corrected if he provided us with evidence that maybe this is more widespread than it is. But guess what? It's not. It's not an issue. And this is about him being afraid of democracy. Because again, we always have to call it like we see it. Republicans don't want the turnout to be increased. And if you reduce the obstacles to voting, if you offer everyone automatic voter registration and mail-in ballots, and you make voting a national holiday guess what's going to happen? More people will turn out and Republicans will lose because they have a fixed block of people that is always going to loyally turn out for them. And, you know, each election will hinge on whether or not Democrats are successful at getting out the vote. So they know that if they can just suppress the vote by demoralizing people or making voter voting a little bit more difficult, they can win. That's what this is about. Don't let him tell you anything other than that. This is about his own self-interest. He doesn't actually care about fraud. He doesn't. If he truly was concerned with voter fraud, then any election where it comes within 2%, for example, if it's a close race, 
that can trigger an automatic audit. He can tell Congress, send me that bill and I'll sign it into law. He can do that. There are ways that you can take precautions to audit the vote, right? Make voting more secure. Pass, you know, election security bills that have been introduced in Congress, right? Tulsi Gabbard has one. That's great. But he's he's not doing that because he's a fraud. That's the thing. The only fraud here when we're talking about mail-in voting is Donald Trump, who is completely full of shit and somehow becoming even more unhinged than he usually is. Hello, everyone. I am here with Paula Jean Swearingen running for the United States Senate in West Virginia. You all know her. You all love her. She's back to give us an update about her campaign. Paula, welcome back to the program. Thank you for coming on. Thank you, Mike. It's always a pleasure to be on your show. You're great. And thank you for always amplifying progressive voices. Well, thank you. Thank you for running. And I had to bring you back because we're in a really different situation currently. You know, you ran against Joe Manchin mm -hmm. and you got a large portion of the vote but didn't win and we were gutted. But now you're back and you're the favorite. Mm -hmm. You're running a very viable campaign and you can win this. So talk about the dynamics and how you can actually defeat Shelley Capito Moore. Well, um, you know, well, for first of all, let's talk about personal reasons and why I'm running against her. She's out, you know, she's voted against equal pay for women three times. Um, she's a mother and a grandmother. She's been in office for almost 20 years. Her dad was our former governor. And um, she's basically a rubber stamp for, you know, like Mitch McConnell. And uh, she was elected to be the first United States senator, first woman to be to represent West Virginia in the U.S. Senate. And um, she's really did nothing for us. And she's a mother. and She's a grandmother. And she's turned her back on the children dying and starving in this state. And it's time for her to face a mother and a grandmother and, uh, you know, kick her out, make sure that we do have a good voice in Washington and have a good, strong woman in Washington. Because I think that maybe have been West Virginia's intent to send her there. But she's not taking care of women and children in this state. And our state, the population in West Virginia is like 51, 52 percent women. And, uh, you know, we are not divided by partisan politics when it comes to our children and women are ready to fight back. Um, it's been really incredible. And I want to thank everybody across the nation that has supported this campaign this time. Um, it really solidifies that you can have a people funded campaign. We have outraised everyone eight to one. Um, we have an incredible staff, I have incredible campaign manager, finance director, comms director, incredible people in field. A lot of people have um, signed up to volunteer to make phone calls and to send texts during this pandemic. And actually, a lot of West Virginians that don't live in the state anymore have donated to the campaign just because they want to come back home. Yeah, this is really incredible because, you know, what I hear from congressional candidates who have run multiple times is that the first time you know you run and it's difficult you kind of try to find your footing but the second time you build up a really well-oiled machine you have connections you have you know a lot of people that you know who become your staffers and now your campaign is incredible so the, the eight to one fundraising that really is important because you are a campaign everyone in my audience knows you're not taking any money from large multinational corporations mm -hmm. this is all people powered so that fact in and of itself is astonishing and now that you're positioned to win it's it's incredible like it feels like we actually can affect change and for everyone who's feeling demoralized about the 2020 election since bernie sanders didn't win you know these congressional races this is our fight now this is where we can affect change it, it's right. not all over 2020 is still you know uh the election is months away and races like this, imagine if Paula Jean Swearingen were to be elected to the U.S. Senate. The things that you would accomplish, I, I think you would be very effective because, you know, for you, something that you said before you went on, it, it stood out with me. And you've said this before. This is a fight for survival. This isn't about, you know, a vanity project. You're not running right. because you, you think that this is, you know, a good career opportunity for you. You're running because this is a fight for survival. So let's say you get elected, you get sworn in in 2021. What is going to be your first policy priorities, because assuming Donald Trump is defeated and let's just say Democrats take back, you know, uh, the Senate and they have the White House, what are you going to push for? Because there's going to be a lot of voices, you know, in, in Congress, in the Senate that will try to marginalize you. Chuck Schumer probably will try to marginalize you, as we've seen from other progressives, you know, with regard to the House and Nancy Pelosi. So what do you think you would really push for immediately in terms of relief for Americans? 
Um, we'll get to that, but let's talk about our movement for a second and the importance. Um, that's one of the reasons, too, that I decided to run for United States Senate because uh, we do need good, strong people representatives in Congress. And the Senate plays a large role in electing um, the Supreme Court, so it's vitally important. And one person can't go and con- go to Congress and change everything. So this is a movement. It continues to grow. No matter who our president is, we have to have a good, strong Congress. And I Everybody, you know, don't give up hope. We have a whole slate of candidates with brand new Congress. I worked with them in 2018, and I'm incredibly proud of brand new Congress. And I fully believe in them because of the way they vet their candidates. And they give voters a chance of having real people representatives and that, what, how, without having to go through the weeds and pick out who actually has integrity. So, you know, don't forget brand new Congress, brand new Congress.org, because if I do go to Congress, it's not going to be just me. Uh, it, it's going to have to take a whole slate of candidates and, um, you know, it, it's it's going to take a bunch of us. We have to keep on pushing that needle, too. We're going to suffer losses, and we have in our movement, but we've also had some wins. And even if we don't win, we keep on pushing that needle with our incumbents. We They know that we're holding them more accountable. Even with Joe Manchin, we've seen him make better decisions this year because we have pushed him so hard. I've given credit for some of the things that he's done. And, you know, we we if we hold them accountable, then they'll do better. But if they don't do better, then they need to know that we're going to come take their jobs. Um, as far as when I get there, we still have a chance for Medicare for all. I still stand behind Medicare for all 100 percent. The first thing I would do in Congress is co-sponsor Medicare for all. And it's going to take all of us to push whoever our president is to make sure that it's implemented, because even the Trump administration promised us universal health care. I'm behind Bernie's bill because it, it uh, it's comprehensive. It covers uh, dental and vision. But also in that bill is just transition for people that work in insurance companies. And that's important to me because even here in West Virginia with the, you know, with the uh, loss in the market for the coal industry, people are dying and starving. So when we do advance and grow, we have to make sure that we do have just transition. Secondary to that, you know, it's important to me to make sure that we combat the addiction epidemic, not only in my state, but in my across the country. And right now, West Virginia leads and drug overdose deaths. And I want to send federal funding to long-term recovery systems. We have seen uh, with the people that are working to combat this crisis in the front lines of our communities and across the country that long-term recovery systems work. We've been hearing from our incumbents that they are gonna take care of the addiction epidemic and drug replacement therapy plays a small role in ending addiction because it takes that money from big pharma, you know, takes that money from big pharma and puts it right back into big pharma. And it's it's not creating long-term solutions. And it's been proven statistically that long-term recovery systems work and they need state and federal funding and they need support from medical providers and social workers. I will fight for a living wage. I mean, I'll fight for everything that I've always fought for. Um, economic diversity for my state and sta- states like mine is very important to me. The Industrial Revolution was built on the backs of West Virginians, their families and surrounding communities. When you turn on your light switch, it's been, you know, it's it's by the blood of Appalachians. And the least that we can do is invest in things like the Reclaim Act, the Green New Deal, and make sure that uh, we put funding in states like ours so we can grow and diversify our economy. Uh, When we look at diversification for our economy in West Virginia, if we legalize cannabis, which I am for, legalization and decriminalization 100 percent we would see economic growth in our state within six to eight months if we grew hemp on mountaintop removal sites not only would it clean up clean up the soil it create create topsoil and you know we could tap into that agriculture um, we have a lot of hot spots for uh, geothermal and hydropower here in the state um, we can invest in that a lot of people don't have comprehensive broadband across the state we've heard from our senators that they're gonna give some relief and and make sure that we have comprehensive broadband, but it doesn't happen. It seems like it's a political talking point. If we have good roads, we have good schools, we have a good infrastructure, we invest in clean water, clean air, and create a place where businesses will wanna come and grow here, then then business, business will come here. And we, you know, there's all kinds of ideas we could have for the Appalachian region, but we just need visionaries for our future instead of visionaries for our demise and make sure that we get dark money out of politics 
and we have true people servants as opposed to people that are serving corporations, lobbyists, and special interests. Uh, you know, there's so many things that we could be doing across the country. Even with this pandemic, I'm really, really frustrated to see states suffer like mine. Uh, because of population, they're opening up West Virginia, and uh, this is one of the poorest and sickest states in the nation. We have high rates of lung disease, heart disease, diabetes, a large uh, bulk of our population is the elderly, and instead of sending relief efforts in the National Guard out into the hills and hollers where people haven't seen daylight, and we don't know what's going on with them living in food deserts, they're talking about opening up our state. So on a state level, we should be taking care of uh, the people here. And on a federal level, we hear so much uh, for that, well, we've got to open up the economy. But we also, in the last stimulus bill, gave over to, you know, trillions of dollars to corporations and Wall Street, you know, and only $1,200. And some of those people have not even received those stimulus checks and, and relief. Um, we can afford $2,000 a month until we figure this out. Public health and safety should not come last. And I know even specifically for my state, how can we trust these people to take care of us when we were treated like collateral damage to begin with? West Virginia shouldn't be a test case or any state, any state in this country. We need to lock down, take care of people, make sure that they have personal protective equipment, the tools that they need to take care of people, make sure that people are fed, they can pay their bills and they're not homeless until we do figure this out. And this just really solidifies the failure in our government that we can't handle a pandemic like this. Yeah, absolutely. Like all of the flaws that already existed pre-COVID-19, they just bubble up to the surface to where if you didn't see them before, there's no way that you don't see them now. And as you go through like your list of all these policy things you want to fight for, something just, you know stood out to me like why you're such a phenomenal candidate and why i'm so invested in this campaign and in you as a politician is because your idea of what you should do what you should fight for it doesn't change based on the political context and what i mean by that is you know there's this sense now that okay bernie lost medicare for all is done we can't get it so you know best case scenario you get to congress and maybe we get a public option you're still saying no i don't care who's president we're fighting for medicare for all that's, That's the right, right policy. That's right. And that is so important because that is true political courage. And that's one thing that I think is lacking with lawmakers. You know, the thing with politics is that you are expected to be overly savvy and you're supposed to, you know, use your political capital wisely. But that time is gone. Like we are at the end of the empire, like the country is collapsing. So there's no time for these silly little games and political theater. We just need relief. We need the policies that will save lives. And there's no debate. Like we know which policies are needed. You just listed all of them. So there's no room for discussion. There's no time for that. That time has come and gone. Now we get those policies and we fight regardless. So I, I think that's just such an important thing for you to say that, you know, I, it doesn't matter who wins? I'm still fighting for Medicare for all. That doesn't change. You know, the calculus, the trajectory, it's not changing because we didn't get a Bernie president. It doesn't change if, you know, Trump is reelected. What's right is right. And we still fight for those policies. So that's why I just love your campaign so much. And I feel so like attached to this campaign because this is a fight for survival. This isn't about anything other than that. Like we're trying to fight for people in West Virginia, in your case, but also the species, because I mean, we're dealing That's with right. a pandemic where, uh, as we record this, almost 100,000 Americans have died. Like, I don't think right. we're going to really realize the scale of, you know, the destruction and devastation until we, we are like past this, until we're out of this, because right now so much is going on. I think that psychologically, a lot of people, myself at least, you just kind of like try to tune it out because it's it's so painful. It's like this type of like uh, coping mechanism in a way. But I want to talk about your race because this time with you running it's so important you're you're so, you're doing a lot you can win this thing um and so there's a challenger that jumped in there's an establishment democrat who isn't really doing that great which kind of leaves the door open for you but another person who individuals mm -hmm. perceived as progressive got a lot of coverage in indie media is richard ojeda now you had announced mm -hmm. that you were running and he decided to jump in the race rather than endorsing you which doesn't make sense to me because if I prioritize policies, if I want Medicare for all, if I want a Green New Deal, and I already see a well-established candidate running a great campaign in the race, I don't jump in myself 
Because what's the point of that? I endorsed that candidate. I campaigned for that candidate. So he could have been a phenomenal ally, but he chose to run against you, which doesn't make sense to me. What Do you want to respond to the Richard Ojeda um, situation? Because it seems as if he, in this instance, rather than endorsing you, could siphon away votes from you from progressives who don't necessarily know that you are the real deal. You're the better candidate, I think, objectively speaking, if you're on the left. So do you want to speak to that at all? I believe in democracy. I believe that anybody can run for office if they want to. However, when we strategically think about this movement, you know, we had we need to think about how to take, you know, the, the main goal was to get rid of Shelley Moore Capito. You know, that's our bad guy, right? Or supposed to be. But um, I think oftentimes people are in this for the wrong reasons. They are more in it to get famous instead of actually staying on point. And I think West Virginians deserve consistency. They don't need um, somebody that's going to pull back from Medicare for all or is going to be wishy-washy about coal. They support it one day, the next day they don't. And that's the worst lie a politician can tell is the coal industry is going to rebound. We had over 170 coal miners and 120,000 coal miners in the 1970s. We, nationwide, we have less than 50,000. And the rug has been pulled out from under West Virginians. And it's not, you know, we just we shouldn't be making decisions, just like you said, for political expediency. Not only West Virginia, but everybody across the country needs consistency and they need integrity. I'm not in this to be famous. I'm a country girl. I don't want to go to D.C., but I'd cut my leg off for my kids in West Virginians. And that's why I even think about going is because we're underserved and this nation was built by the people, for the people and of the people. And who better to serve us than us? We have been solving our problems in the front lines of our communities for decades. Why our incumbents are serving corporations and lobbyists. And um, I fought for my state for years. And the reason I'm running for office, too, is because I'm tired of begging. I'm tired of people in my state begging for something so basic as a clean glass of water and a job. And we can have both. Um, in addition to that, you know, we don't need somebody lying to us and saying that they're not taking dark money when the FEC says otherwise. Uh, we, you know, we don't need people that are forty five thousand dollars in debt from their last race. And we don't need somebody that's going to. A win an election, have West Virginians work hard to get them into a seat and then them turn around, quit their seat four days later, you know, four days later, run for president and then quit their seat again. Uh, you know, we just don't deserve that. We need consistency. I can't tell you what my opponent is you know, thinking, but we have proven what, that we're the most viable. And uh, I just encourage everybody just to continue to vet your candidates and keep your eye on the prize. Because uh, there's a lot of people that have tried to hijack the present progressive movement. And we do have a lot of fake progressives. You know, you can research where their money comes from. You can look at their history and look at the videos. That, you know, uh, Google is a, a great tool right now. So you can find out more about your candidates. I can't tell you why he's doing it, it you know, but... The main goal for me is to make sure that we have true representation in Washington. And one thing that I want to add about that, too, is West Virginians are tired of not having a seat at the table. When somebody goes into you know, an elected office, they're just not there to, to just be a voice, but they should be a medium for the people that they're supposed to serve. And so it's important to me when I do go to Congress that all these people that I've worked with throughout the years that I've, I've seen in the front lines of our communities, battle and addiction, you know, making sure that our children are fed during crises, uh, make, you know, making sure that, uh, you know, that, uh, you know, we're combating poverty and all these things that are going on in my state, that they have a seat at the table. They're going to, you know, West Virginians are going to help me and people across the country help me write legislation um, and that I introduce because it's important to me that West Virginians do have a voice. Uh, I want to be a public servant and that's what we deserve. And I know there's a lot of people that have went into Congress and sell out. They're barking up the wrong tree. Like I said, I don't even want to be there. I'd cut my leg off for my grandchildren and, and children. And I'm doing this because we have to survive. People actually are dying and starving every day. This pandemic even solidifies it. Essential workers need essential things like jobs and being able to pay their, I mean, you know, food and be able to pay their rent. And I'm just tired of living like we do. And I'm tired of begging people that are supposed to serve us and they've not done anything, especially for West Virginia. They've been pissing on our backs and saying it's raining for years and we're tired of being abused. Yeah. Yeah. And, and uh, I'm glad that you said that about, um, you know, you don't want to be in Congress because that's 
ideally the person who you want to represent you, someone who doesn't want to be there, someone who isn't running because, you know, you can become a celebrity or an influencer. Um, and I'm also glad that you pointed out the fact that, you know, this is a democracy. As left wingers, we support democracy because, you know, in my race in District 1 of Oregon, I had a really great uh set of choices. So there were two women running, Amanda Seavey and Heidi Briones. And this was a real like fantastic uh, campaign between the both of them because you had Amanda Seavey who was championing uh, disability rights and Medicare for all. And then you had mm -hmm. Heidi Briones who was really pushing for UBI. And between both of them, you could, you could tell that there was like this real sense that they have different competing priorities. But in this instance, in your race, it's not like, you know, Richard Ojeda chose to jump in because he he's really committed to one set of ideals. We don't know where he mm -hmm. stands on Medicare for all. He supported a public option and then he said he supported Medicare for all. He voted for Trump in 2016 and then he apparently was a Bernie Sanders supporter. Uh, he is supposedly progressive, but yet he's buddy buddy with Joe Manchin. None of this makes any sense to me. And so, like, if, if he were to jump in the race because he says, you know what, Paula, you're not talking about this issue. And I think that West Virginians need to know about this. I think that intellectually speaking, uh, you know, mm -hmm. we should grant him that space. That'd be fantastic. But this is clearly a right. ploy to gain attention. You know, and now I'll tell you right now, do I want to challenge Shelley Moore Capito, who I think is absolute garbage? If I did that, I would find myself going head to head with Paula Jean Swearingen. Once again, not a fan of Paula Jean Swearingen either. Paula Jean Swearingen threw stones at me because absolutely she just could not stand the fact that I wouldn't daggone basically run down the, up and down the roads and screaming that Joe Manchin sucked because I knew she couldn't beat Patrick Morrissey. So I supported Joe and I don't give a shit if you like that or you don't. I don't want to, you know, dog on Richard Ojeda. This isn't about him. This is about pe the people of West Virginia. But it is important for people to know that you have to look at the record, uh, look at the platforms of people. Uh, Richard Ojeda has no platform on his website, whereas Paula Jean is very committed to policy, you know. Um, so you have to vet people. And, you know, when it comes to the progressive movement, uh, there is this, there is a leadership crisis, right? Because we're not necessarily mm -hmm. going to have another Bernie Sanders run for president anytime soon. So we're looking for that next progressive hero. And some people say the right things and step up. And so basically my my overall point is that we have to be a lot more cautious and vet people a lot more. Don't be overly skeptical, but just acknowledge that if you have a set of options, really vet these candidates. I think that if you have followed, you know, your campaign and your activism pre-campaign, I mean, there's there's no question in my mind you're committed to these ideals and you're going to go to Congress committed and fighting. And even if you lose, you're mm -hmm. going to go down swinging, you know, so that's why I think it's really important. And I wanted to, you know, make it known because a lot of progressives, I think, were, for lack of a better word, duped by Richard Ojeda uh, back in 2018 when he did run, I think, an admittedly good campaign against Carol Miller. But times have changed. And, you know. We need real leadership. I'm, I'm not looking for a celebrity. I'm not looking for someone who's going to make headlines and say the right things. I want a fighter who's going to fight for the people. And that's why I, I thought that this was important to bring up. So thank you for addressing that. I didn't want to put you on the spot. And I will say that if Richard Ojeda is, you know, actually committed to policy, he could debate you. But he doesn't want to do that. Yeah, he's publicly denied at, uh, denied a debate, and uh, that I think that's a disservice to voters. And I think voters need to hear from all sides. And it's it's not it shouldn't be about giving your opponent a microphone and make you you know you being worried about you're going to raise their profile. It, you know, voters didn't need to hear policy from all their candidates so they can have, make informative decisions. Here we are in our primaries June 9th, and we've not had one debate uh, for U.S. Senate. And I really think that's a real disservice to West Virginia voters. And I really think it's a disservice that, uh, uh, you know, Richard Ojeda is refusing to give that to West Virginians. And I think that goes against our democracy. Yeah, I mean, if you're going to run for Congress, you have to be ready to debate because you're constantly debating. Like, this isn't like those idiotic debates that you see on YouTube. Debate me, bro. Like, these are two people who are mm -hmm. running for the United States Senate. So they have to debate, you know? So this is important. So much is on the line. Like, now is not the time to play games. And, you know, to that point about, you know, so much being on the line and us fighting for our survival, I wanted to ask you because you... You've always been fighting. Um, you've always been in the trenches. You haven't stopped. And so, you know, a presidential race not going our way isn't going to change that trajectory for you. So I'm curious, it, 
I don't want to ask you for words of encouragement, but what do you say to people who currently feel like, you know what, I can't deal with electoral politics, so I'm going to check out. How do you get people to still fight after, you know, being faced with so much defeat? Because this is something that I'm asking myself lately. Like, how do I keep, you know, that that spark lit? Um, and I don't know that there's a good answer. I think that maybe when we're past this election, past this pandemic, maybe the dust will settle and there'll be like a clear message of unity for the left and what we should do. But like, what is your message to people at a time of defeat in terms of like what we should keep doing? Well, it's, I may be the wrong person to ask because I've got a fire in me that I can't put out. I've been fighting for my state for years and win or lose any election. I'm going to continue to fight for my state. And, you know, I'm a mother and a grandmother now, and uh, I do anything for my children and I can't stop. But I know working within the movements throughout the years, you know, make sure that we're working together. Like I said, uh, we're going to suffer some losses identify grifters in our movement and make sure that there's a place for that. But, you know, it's it, it's passing the bullhorn to the people. You know, the people in front of the pain should be in front of the power always. And we always have to continue to unite. We have to continue to stick together. Self-care is important. When you feel beat down, take a breath, get back up and get back to fighting and organizing. We have to stick together. Even, you know, when I've been fighting for water for my state for years, it wasn't about just, you know, the people in Payton City right now that are dealing with a water crisis. It's still about the people in Flint, Michigan that I worked with and people across the country. You know, when somebody out of state says we're having a rally, we're doing this, we need help. Everybody should be busting and showing up and showing up together. Uh, we don't need heroes. We can't look at one person to save us. If we want to save our country and we want a future for our children and grandchildren, my hashtag, Unite Our Fight, is just that. I've been saying that for years. We have to stick together. It's not about partisan politics. It's not about who's left, who's right, even if I'm, you know, as public servants. Everybody don't have to agree on everything, but the common goal should be in making sure that the people in this country have good representation and their needs are met and they're not begging for their basic human rights. So just stick together and move forward. Even Bernie said it. He wasn't looking to be a hero. We heard him over and over and over run for office, local level to federal level. But even if you're not cut out to run for office, there's always a place for somebody in this movement, even if you're making copies for a rally. There's always a place for somebody. You know, I remember one of my mentors, whenever he met somebody, the first thing he said is you are somebody. And remember that. And you are important. Don't give up. We are going to suffer losses, but we have to stick together and we have to keep going. I'm glad that you said, you know, that even if it's making copies, because there really is. And I know that this doesn't sound like much, but like there's no contribution that's too small. Anything that you can do to push us forward in the correct direction, I think that really does matter. And it may feel like everything that we're doing currently isn't going to amount to much, but trust me, it will. And I want to um, mm -hmm. uh, quote what Jamie Peck of the Majority Report said, because she said something recently that resonated with me. She said that the same underlying material conditions that led to you know the rise of Donald Trump, that led to the creation of a Bernie Sanders movement, those are still going to exist. So it's not like all of mm -hmm. a sudden things are going to get better and the movement will dissipate. So long as there is a need for these types of policies to be enacted, I think there's going to be a will to fight. And keep that in mind, because for me, one of the biggest worries that I had after Bernie had dropped out was that, you know, where does the movement go? Can the movement be sustained? And I think the answer is yes. I think that Bernie wasn't the creation of a new movement. I think it was the continuation of previous movements, you know, not just Occupy, but movements before that. So it really, it is important that people don't check out as easy as it may feel to do that. You know, as, um, as a, yeah, don't check out. It's time to check in harder. Yeah, exactly. And it seems like, like to me, it seems alluring to want to check out currently. You know, I try to do self-care mm -hmm. as much as I can. But, you know, we just have to fight harder. And that's why we have to elect people like you to Congress. Because there is a lot of people running for Congress that are phenomenal, that I truly believe will help mm -hmm. transform the country. But you have really struck a chord with people. And I notice this with my audience as well, whenever you come on, because... You are not just sincere, but you really speak to the very specific needs of people in West Virginia and across the country. And I think that that's lacking. Like whenever I hear from a politician, they have these vague, you know, um, general 
things that their constituents need but they're not like these aren't lived experiences these are talking mm -hmm. points and it's important mm -hmm. that we do elect real people so uh tell us what we can do to support your campaign because you're on the cusp of winning and if you win this primary um which is uh, we'll, we'll get the date from you but if you win this primary we're in a position to defeat Shelly Moore Capito. I, I think I've you alternated between Shelly Moore Capito and Shelly Capito Moore. I always butcher her name, but that's not important because it's we're going to forget. No, it's okay. Oh, it is. Everybody butchers I, my name too. <laughs> I didn't even pronounce it correctly, but you know what? It doesn't matter <laughs> because she's going to be going bye bye very soon. Uh, so tell us what we can do to support your campaign, Paula. Well, uh, right now we need new phone bankers um, and we need people to send texts. So if you want to reach out to field, uh, we early voting started today, which people were already voting because they opened up the absentee ballot process to everyone and people are also mailing in their ballots and their primary was extended to June 9th. So if, if people can reach out to my field person, his name is Andrew at PaulaJean.com. Um, he'll get you hooked up to do that. And also, I mean, I know it's a trying time, but our campaign is 100% people funded. So if everybody can donate a dollar, then that's going to help us send those texts and help make phone calls and things that we need to do. Um, but most importantly, uh, what everybody can do for my campaign is not give up. We still are in this together and, uh, please don't give up hope. I mean, there's, there's children are dying and starving across this country. I feel like our generation has made this mess and it's, 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 it's up to us to fix it. So our children don't inherit it. Basically the way that I'm trying to view this is, you know, Fighting shouldn't be a choice for us. It should just be automatic, regardless of the outcome of elections or, you know, what state the country or world is in. You fight. That's what the left does. Uh, the left yeah, has and, to fight. And labor, you know, and the unions back in the rights of workers and start unionizing, too. I'm very pro-union. And we have to make sure that people across the country have the right to collective bargaining and uh, making sure that workers are paid a living wage and people are treated right in the workplace. And people, you know, we don't have a large homeless population. We're taking care of our veterans when they come home. I mean, all those things, they're just basic human rights. And we, you know, we know we, it, it's not that we don't have money in this country. We have a moral problem. And that moral problem goes into our budgeting. And we're not spending money in ways that we should be. And, and you know what? Nobody should be treated like collateral damage. I know what it's like. I know what it's like to bury my family members to industry and not get anything in return for it, which I shouldn't want anything in return. I just like to have my family members back. So, you know, it, it's it's important. And I just want to thank everybody across the country for everything that they're doing. And you, Mike, for, uh, you know, being in this movement and amplifying the voices of the voiceless and you know, because oftentimes candidates do not get the media that they deserve. Um, and you are, you are still a great big part of this movement. And thank you for all the hard work that you do. Oh, that means so much. Thank you. Honestly, thank you so much for running because this really is, and we talked about this before um, when we did our panel discussion with Corey Bush and Amy Valella, this is such a huge mm -hmm. self-sacrifice. Like you're giving up so much time, a huge portion of your life um, so it, it takes a lot of dedication and willpower to run. And so if there were nobody to run, then this movement would be dead. But the fact that there are so many thank great you. candidates, I mean, it, we have something to fight for. It's not over. So thank you so much for running. We will be watching you. your campaign very closely. Uh, thank you so much, Paula. Thank you, Mike. Well, that's it. I think that... Uh, there's nothing left to be said. Well, actually, there's plenty of left to be said, but I've uh, I've run out of steam. Uh, this was another demoralizing week, but guess what? We're all in it together. So, uh, you know, at least if we're going to be miserable, we're miserable together. I don't know. <laughs> not very encouraging, not like the best way to leave it. But um, look, it is what it is. Uh, if you want to support the show, I'll leave you with the links down below. And before we check out, I can't not thank all of our Patreon, PayPal, and YouTube members for helping the show not just to survive, but actually thrive in a time when uh, YouTube is trying to suppress independent media. So thank you all so much. Um, that's it. I'm out. My name is Mike Figueredo. This has been The Humanist Report. Take care, everyone. I'll see you next week.